Good morning. Come on, it's a beautiful morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you go, that's better. Welcome to Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism on a really beautiful day. This is probably the best day we've had since uh, about um, the last time we had an open house last spring. It's been a terrible winter here, so we are pleased to have this great weather and we'll credit you with bringing that to us. Um, we're pleased to have those of you who were here yesterday back and those of you joining us new today, welcome. And for all of you around the world who are unable to be with us and joining us on our live webcast, uh, welcome to you as well. I'm Ernest Sotomayor, I'm the Dean of Student Affairs and I work with a team of great people who oversee all of the life issues with um, students, um, student services, career services, and I work very closely with the Office of Admissions and Financial Aid. This is the 11th group of students that I have been lucky enough to greet since I came to the journalism school a decade ago. And it's always exciting uh, year after year to be here with you, help you um, get information that you need to make a decision. Uh, and we hope that you enjoy the weekend as well as you go through the process of making a decision about uh, what we have to offer you, whether it's the right fit, and whether this is a school for you. Um, yesterday, you heard a lot of information from students and some faculty members, those of you who met with faculty members, and especially from our Dean of Academic Affairs, Sheila Cornell, who provided a view of some of the treasures that we hold here and the reasons to consider uh, joining us you know, recent graduates and some current students uh, yesterday and today will discuss their experiences and have, you know, talk to you about what they liked, what they didn't like, what they thought worked, and some advice for you on how to prepare and what Columbia has meant. You'll hear more of that today. You know, faculty members explained the uh, curriculum uh, and what you can expect in the classroom and in the field work once you arrive and make no mistake, this is a school where field work from the very first day you arrive is a critical part of your education. The other thing that you heard yesterday, which I want you to take uh, uh, note of and remember, is that every one of you is part of the faculty in a little way. You heard students talk about how important it was to be seated next to people from all over the world, the different states, the different countries, the different backgrounds, the different levels of experience. That's an immensely critical part of what you get by joining this team. And it, rem and it remains part of what you are buying into when you come into Columbia. Uh, we consider ourselves the most powerful journalism network on the face of the earth, and we prove that in many ways every, uh, every year. So you're here to find out information, and we're here to answer your questions. So we want you to be like the aspiring journalists that um, we will train you to be and to not be hesitant to ask any questions about whatever it is uh, is on your mind. And if you uh, feel too shy for whatever reason to ask them in an open forum and come up to us in the hallways, send us emails later on if you don't think of a question today and we'll get the answers for you. And we'll, um, we'll have you know, plenty of people who can tell you uh, what you feel you need to know. We'll begin this morning with a discussion from one of our guests who, quite frankly, has been somewhat difficult to, uh, to get in contact with in recent weeks. And I'll tell you why. The Israelis have been holding national elections. The German airliner has deliberately crashed into the mountains in France. A historic nuclear control deal in Iran is under negotiation in Switzerland. Somali rebels cross the border into Kenya and kill 147 people. Yemen's government collapses and the Saudi Arabia uh, military moves in to control the rebels. Prosecutor planning to indict the president of Argentina, found dead in his bathroom floor, shot to death. The US is attempting to normalize relations with Cuba. Oh, and did you know that there's a war still raging in Ukraine? <clears throat> I could go on for a lot of hours about all the mountains of international news coverage that our guest, Anup Kafle, has helped to coordinate 
and uh, coverage in recent weeks and months as the digital editor for foreign and national security at the Washington Post. But I'm going to let him discuss his work with you, how his time at Columbia helped make it possible for him to be among and work alongside some of the finest international journalists on the face of the earth. And he's going to offer you some advice for you to consider as you make a decision so you can do the kind of work that he's done. He came to us in 2007 from a little school in Tennessee that we'd never really heard of, Tuscaloom College. He was fresh from Nepal, not even knowing the difference between root beer and real beer. What he came with, however, was an ability to think critically about news, how to tell an ordinary story from a great one. And what he learned here was how to go out and find the information to create a great story. He came prepared to absorb every grain of knowledge at Columbia from fellow students, from street reporting, from the faculty, to find the information that no one else was going to seek in ways that no one else would seek, and to be able to learn how to tell stories, great stories, on multiple platforms. He uses these skills every day in his work as an editor, but he also uses them all the time on many occasions when he's writing his own stories, when he's building graphics, when he's out shooting videos or taking still photography for reports that he's preparing on himself on many different uh, stories and issues from places like Afghanistan, Nepal, uh, Qatar, Egypt, Mexico, and many others. What he's going to be too humble to tell you this morning, I think, will be how he started his professional career after he left here with an internship, a long-term internship at the Atlantic Company's uh, venerated publishing company that really had not yet dipped its toe into the digital space. He was among a, a small team of uh, up-and-coming journalists who were brought in to innovate, to create new products at a time they really didn't know how to do that. It was, he was also one of the very few people that year, uh, and in recent years, who was sponsored long-term as an international student to remain in the United States. The Atlantic Companies is a very different company because of the work that those people did, and that's part of what he brought to the industry. A tour of his online portfolio, anoopcoffee.com, is like a lesson on the excellence in journalism, and I urge you to visit it sometime. But not right now, put your laptops and your phones away, and pay attention to what he's going to tell you, and get around to that later on. To say that he has excelled is really an understatement. And we have invited him back here many times to share what he knows, his expertise and his advice with students. And we've done so more so than we have a right to ask. But I am very pleased and you are very lucky that he agreed to be with us today. Please welcome my friend, my colleague, and our former student from the class of 2008, Anoop Kafle. Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you, Ernie, for that very kind introduction. Um, I don't know if I deserved it all, but um, really appreciate it, and it's great to be back at the journalism school after about seven years now. Um, uh, eight years before uh, when I started here, I was just an international student who had graduated from a small college in eastern Tennessee. Many hadn't heard of the college. Uh, my bylines were limited to a campus newspaper that was read by maybe 200 students at the most. I had no solid reporting internship that would lead me to a newsroom job. Um, and most importantly, I was still in the process of learning English as a foreign language. Uh, today, I kind of have a dream journalism job. Uh, I work as a digital foreign editor at the Washington Post, and that's one of the two digital editors on the desk whose sole job is to guide the newspaper's international coverage on the web. In my almost six years at the Post, I have had the opportunity to work on some of the most biggest stories of our time. Uh, Ernie told you about uh, some of these stories, but you know, I, I want to mention a few. The surge in Afghanistan, uh, the Arab Spring, which happened right after I joined the Foreign Desk, the war in Syria, the killing of Osama bin Laden, the death of North Korea's Kim Jong-il, WikiLeaks, NSA's surveillance program. I have been able to witness and participate in telling 
some of the most important stories of the last decade. However, I want to tell you that when I joined Columbia, I came here with the hopes of becoming a magazine writer. You know, the types that grew a beard, carried a backpack, sat on the back of pickup trucks, and drove around in some shady part of the world to write 10,000 word essays. That's what I wanted to do. But the day I arrived here, um, just like you on, um, you know, for open house, first year school, uh, all the professors were discussing a new kind of journalism platform that was disrupting traditional way of storytelling. And it was disrupting it very fast. It was called the internet. This is 2007. It didn't take me long to realize that uh, storytelling was changing. And if I wasn't prepared for the new world of journalism, I will have wasted my time here. I spent the next year focusing on newspaper reporting and digital media, the combination of which is solely responsible for taking me where I am today. The decision you are about to make is going to be one of the most important decisions in your career. Many of you here most likely come with the same sort of aspirations I once did, to become a journalist who works on significant stories, to get bylines, to produce rich, memorable storytelling, whatever medium that may be in. I have been able to do these in some shape or form after I left Columbia. By coming to the J School, I managed to acquire the multimedia skills that were demanded by a changing journalism industry. But let me tell you something. The most rewarding and the only irreplaceable skill that I learned here was reporting and crafting that into a story. When I joined the J School, journalism world was talking about the importance of videos and interactive graphics. Everybody wanted to do videos, everybody wanted to do interactive graphics. The urgency to know how to build a single serving website that told the story, the need to become a one-man band that could report, write, shoot videos, record audio, take photographs, code a website, make things move and dance, etc., etc. That meant you were somehow expected to know Dreamweaver, if you've heard of Dreamweaver, Flash, Final Cut, maybe Pro Tools, and a couple other softwares to be able to fully produce a story that you would work on. Between classes and um, spending my nights here in the labs, I did manage to pick up some technical skills. But by the time I started at the Washington Post, less than two years later, most of these tools had become useless. They were replaced by new programs. When you tell people that you knew Flash, people would laugh at you. The one thing that did not and has not been replaced is the one you will learn to excel at the most when you come to Columbia. That is reporting and storytelling. I often think about how different my career would have been if I hadn't made the choices that I made here. The very first class that I took here, which lasted an entire semester, it was called RW1, the Reporting and Writing Seminar. Although it does not exist here now in that form, the core of the class that replaced it remains the same, teaching you how to go out and report a story. Before I started that class, I had never reported on a beat before. For a full semester, uh, when I was here, I went to Sunset Park in Brooklyn, which was my beat, to, to find stories, to report, and write them. A couple of months into the class, I got my first byline. One of the stories was published in the New York Daily News. It was a simple story about a barbershop in the neighborhood. But the editor I worked with said she liked the colorful quotes that I had managed to bring from a man who had been running it for 40 years. Several newspapers had written about him. That would not have happened if the professor I was working with was not willing to edit my story over and over again. The reporting and writing class taught me how to ask the right questions and when to ask those questions. It taught me the importance of knowing your beat inside out so when you jump on any story, you knew exactly who your sources should be, what type of questions to ask, and how to find leads that would help advance your reporting. Every time I completed one story, I knew I had come out with an idea for another story. One of my first assignments after graduation took me to Kandahar province in Afghanistan. Because I was embedded with the NATO soldiers, I was moving from one place to another quickly, which meant I had little time to waste. I needed to make sure I was observing keenly, I was asking the right questions, and making sure I had everything I needed to complete my story before I left that location for another place. Frankly speaking, these were the very skills I learned here in my RW1 class. I want to talk about the other class that I took here, which was called Covering Conflicts. In that class, 
we weren't reading textbooks on how other people in our profession covered the Vietnam War or covered the Gulf War. We were actually covering conflicts in real time. My beat was Sudan. I followed the developments in Sudan throughout the semester and learned how to file a news story, how to write a news analysis, and how to interview experts. We'd get on Skype in the middle of the night to interview these experts around the world. A couple of years later, when I went to the Washington Post, South Sudan became an independent country. So it was helpful to me that I had covered Sudan here. Fast forward three years later again, and um, I was sitting inside a cold mud hut in a remote village in Afghanistan, uh, reporting on these rag track um, group of villagers who were trained to fight uh, the Taliban. Whatever I was doing for my class assignment three years earlier, I was repeating most of the same tricks there when I was reporting in Afghanistan. Um, I may have tweeted my photos, I may have updated my Facebook status, bragging about where I was, what I was doing. I posted the photo you saw earlier everywhere. Um, ultimately, the only thing that brought people back was the story that I was working on. That said, I don't want to discount the importance of social media or the new kind of journalism that we are seeing on our screens every day. Headlines are crucial to your story. Uh, when you work in a newsroom, you will hear more and more about headlines these days. Uh, you, know, you will need to develop skills in writing a very witty, shareable headline that will make a reader want to click on your story. It's likely you will have to write an aggregated listicle to describe a particular trending story on the web. You will also have to know how to hold your phone steady and use Snapchat. If you're in the middle of a protest, your editors will likely ask you to live stream using Meerkat and Periscope. But remember, to get to any newsroom where you will potentially be doing all of these things on your phone, on technology, you will have to know how to report first. Your Instagrams, your Snapchats, your tweets, they're all temporary. What you will be remembered for is your reporting and your storytelling. You can hang around expensive DSLRs around your neck. You can attach GoPro cameras on your helmets. But remember that the most important thing you carry as a journalist is your questions and your, your curiosity for the story you're about to report on. The point I'm trying to make here is all of these multimedia skills, all of these social media skills can be acquired in a short time. Many of these skills will have a shorter self-life. The important thing to acquire to remain relevant in this profession is the mindset, the reporting mindset. And that is what you will do here at Columbia Journalism School. Everyone who comes to journalism school here at Columbia is seeking something different from their experience. Some of you may want to be in the Stabile investigative program. Uh, others may have a terrific book idea that you want to expand upon in Professor Friedman's class. Uh, some of you may want to do video journalism. But whatever class that you take here, your instructors put storytelling at the core of everything. Now, having attended the school, I think I'm in a position to offer you some advice on the lessons that I learned here, the mistakes that I made, um, and the things that I would not repeat if I were to do this again. First, keep an open mind. The reason why I say that, I told you I came, I came here wanting to become a magazine writer, and I quickly gave that up to dive into focusing on digital media. If I hadn't learned how I would do a video story, or when a video actually fits into a story. If I hadn't learned how to find data and when to use that data to create supporting graphics for a story. If I hadn't taken a small risk of learning how to code, something I was absolutely unfamiliar with, I probably wouldn't be in the industry today. Let me tell you, though, that all of these things that I learned, they were in addition to the classes that I was required to take, the reporting classes. I felt that it was important not to box myself into thinking I should immerse myself solely into one thing and nothing else. Also keep in mind, getting a degree at Columbia does not automatically transfer into getting a job at your dream news network or a newspaper publication or an online publication. My advice would be do not plan to stay in New York hoping a job will fall into your lap. You have much bigger chance writing compelling stories that will be read by a wider audience from New Delhi than staying here in New York. So you should plan on going where the stories are. Second, don't get too carried away. And that's important. Um, maybe it was the uncertain period in journalism with, 
dying publications and dwindling jobs when I was at the J school, but I think I let myself focus a lot more than I probably should have, becoming a one-man band. Uh, although I shouldn't completely ignore that most of the jobs for me opened after employers saw my range of skills, I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you that no newsroom today, at least the ones that I can think of, will hire you and ask you to do it all. They will want you to know how to report. Till this day, when I sit down and write, one of my regrets, I always wish I had done more to hone my skills in narrative writing when I was at the journalism school. Third, knock on the doors. I, I encourage you to make appointments with your professors before you knock on their doors. Um, but I don't think I can stress enough on the importance of seeking more from your professors here. Remember, you're paying a significant amount of money to invest in your career here. Make sure what you get in return is to your satisfaction. If you don't get into a class of your liking, ask if you can sit in to listen and absorb. If you didn't do well on your crime assignment, ask if you can report on another crime story and if your professor has time to take a look at it. Get coffee with them. Get beers with them. But make sure that the 10 months that you spend here, you soak things up like a sponge. If you, you will be surprised to know how much knowledge lies within these walls, and it is entirely up to you what you make of it. Fourth, and an important one, um, take it easy. Obviously, you're getting a master's degree here in less than a year, so no joke, it is going to be very tough. But that does not mean you have to kill yourself. And this is very important. I know everybody you know, considers journalism school hard and rough and you constantly have to work. But make friends outside of your classrooms, share ideas with them, offer to take a look at each other's work, go out, have fun. If it encourages you, um, before I started Columbia, after I knew I got in, I took a small private loan, uh, something I called the happy hour loan. Um, just so I had enough pocket money to go drink beers, go out occasionally, make new friends. Uh, the relationships you will make at the J School will be your relationships for life, especially for those of you um, who will decide to continue in journalism. The last and the most important one, work harder than everybody else. This goes without saying, you know our entire profession depends on how hard we work. Report harder, read more, write more, revise again, confirm your quotes, and make that one extra phone call. When you graduate from this place, you will find yourselves among a very impressive group of journalists. Journalists who have reported and told stories for over a century now. You will learn from the professors who have reported for as long as some of you have been alive and won prizes for their terrific work. They will teach you the core craft of storytelling. Simultaneously, you will learn and hear from a very young crop of journalists who visit and teach here who are immersed in the rapidly changing newsrooms around the country and around the world. You will, you will live and report in one of the most diverse cities in the world, preparing you for a village or a neighborhood in any country you might end up in when you graduate from here. And as it has been evident recently, the J School report on Rolling Stone magazine's controversial essay shows that during the most pressing times in journalism, everyone looks up to this institution for guidance. That's the kind of place you will become a part of. When you graduate from here, you will belong to a rock star group of journalists that continues to do some of the finest reporting in every platform you can think of. So I wish you all the best, and thank you so much for having me this morning. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have if you have any questions. Yes? Yeah, how did you get your first job? Can we ask you to come up to the mic? Please speak loudly to the show. So, so, so. Her, her question is, how did I get my first job? Right? Yeah, what is the one you're working in right now? Or uh, there was a there was a different job. Okay, so so when I was uh, when I was at uh, Columbia, I obviously focused a lot more on digital media, and I was trying to think what I should do. I I was debating between whether I should uh, go to New Delhi to work for the AP. Um, I had a six month stint there, or to work uh, at the Atlantic Media Company. What Atlantic was trying to do was build a new suite of websites and sort of reader experience 
for the digital age. They didn't have the wire before. They didn't have, you know, the Atlantic.com didn't exist the way. Before what they did was they entirely dumped everything they were going to publish on the magazine, on the website. That's all they did. So um, I was one of the five people who were hired uh, to sort of think about innovation and how we would start uh, new products for the Atlantic. Can I follow up? Like, how did you end up with um, About a year and a half later, I saw this opening at the Washington Post. Um, Ever since I was a kid, I've been fascinated with foreign policy and foreign affairs, so I wanted to jump at that opportunity. I applied um, and luckily got the job. It was just something that opened and I decided to pursue it. Good morning. Thank morning. you for coming. Um, so you've went into a lot of conflict zones, and I'm wondering what type of like training or what you know tips the professors gave you to prepare you to go into these areas and cover these type of stories. Um, I did go to conflict zones, but let me tell you that when I first tried to go to, um, I, was, I think I tried to go to Congo, and the professor shut it down right after school. She was just like, you're not ready to go. You need reporting experience before you, know, you just jump into a conflict zone. What I learned here was, how do you report in a conflict zone? How do you interact with security you know, when you, soldiers? How do you interact with rebels? You know, how do you report on rape? How do you ask sensitive questions? How do you get out of, like, you know, who are the people you need to, that's why the idea of, like, beat reporting is knowing your beat inside out. Who do you contact when you're in trouble? Or who do you contact when you need a helicopter out of conflict? I'm talking very extreme situations, right? So this class really helps you think inside out, like, you know, everything that you need to know. We, we worked on what we call the parachute memo. You jump into a country, imagine what you're going to do next for 15 days, everything. Where do you find extra cash? How do you get in touch with your government? How do you get in touch with your editor? Um, so those are, those are obviously the logistical details. But the most important thing is it's overwhelming when you go to a new country, especially in a conflict zone, and especially as someone who's young and gets out of the journalism school. Um, I had that problem when I first went to Afghanistan where you're like, oh my god, do I take a photo of this or do I take a video of this? You know, you just have to stick to the core, and that's what I learned here is basically what your story is. And if you take this video journalism class, which is what I was um, doing in Afghanistan, was shooting videos, a duel in two, the professor will ask you to first come up with the idea for your story. You need to write it down. What are you reporting on? Who are your characters? You need to think about everything before you head to a, especially conflict zones, because you want to be ready for it. Does that answer your question? This? No, I'm sorry. Hi. I'm wondering uh, what effect you think, if any, um, the recent violence against journalists has had on international reporting. Thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a great question and, and, and something I think about a lot because there were, there were times when you know, we saw you know, videos of Daniel Pearl, I was still in Nepal, um, and we thought like, well, you know, the profession has become more dangerous than it used to be because you know there were times when you could go and report with the rebels and things would be okay right because they wanted to get the message out and it's changed even more with things like the Islamic State um, so it's changed for journalists on the field as well as journalists like me who are not on the field anymore who are reporting from newsrooms because uh, because of the internet um, I think about all the beheading videos that I've had to watch um, and I think that sort of like, you know, you, you have to start thinking about what effect it, you know, is going to have on you. So we talk to editors about it. Um, we talk about how to sort of deal with those things, how to balance those things. And it's, it's, it's a hard call. So I don't know if I have like a definite answer, but you know, that, that, that trauma might be a strong word, but that effect is definitely there. Um, it's obviously more if you're out on the field because the world's gotten more violent. Um, Insurgents, rebel groups, terrorist groups, they've become more sort of, they don't care if you're a reporter. You know, they will take you and they'll kill you. And for us, uh, the hard decision is, do we show this? What can we show? What can we not show? Um, one of the decisions I made, and you know, along with the editors at the Post, is that we were not going to show the beheading videos. You know, we would watch it and we would tell readers, um, here's what we saw. Um, and you know it was propaganda, and we were just not going to show it. So we we grapple with those decisions every day. Um, 
Um, what's the biggest challenge you feel that journalists face in this profession, and what can we do to overcome this obstacle? Um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll speak in more sort of recent terms. And one of the biggest challenges, at least since I have been in this profession, has been um, really trying to know how to report and write. Uh, it's a struggle because, you know, pe pe there are different kinds of journalism now. Like, you know, you could go work for, you could go write for Gawker, you could go write for ProPublica, Washington Post, BuzzFeed. And um, I think somewhere in trying to catch up with technology, we have forgotten the core essence of like what journalism really is, which is why you know problems like uh, Rolling Stone and you know the Virginia, uh, you know, the Virginia rape story, uh, th those keep happening, and you see a lot more sort of corrections. You know, corrections have become so common these days because everybody's trying to be fast. So I think the challenge now is really trying to cope with the pace of how quickly journalism's changed. Um, and as you know, um, my editor Marty Barron. Um, said a couple of weeks ago, the challenge is what do we keep and what do we discard when you're trying to do, do journalism these days? So, and, and I think to make those decisions, it's important that you sort of you know, get, get trained in knowing the fundamentals of journalism. Uh, because regardless of whether you go to work for Facebook or whether you go work for the New York Times, you will sort of have to know how to capture audience, right? How, and you, you do that by telling a good story and your story has to hold up. So, does that make sense? What advice do you have for international students who would like to do what you did, which is, as was mentioned, so rare and managed to stay here? Um, when you, you mean manage to? Stay continue? in the United States of America. <laughs> um, you know, this is a very honest advice. It was, it was a little bit different when I was here. Um, because nobody, nobody really talked about the need for, you know, I don't want to lump the entire continent, but it's like, you know, now everybody talks about how Africa is the next big thing, right? Uh, Quars is just open bureaus in Africa, and um, uh, they're covering, you know, Kenya is a huge place, uh, India, everybody's opening bureaus in India, including Huffington Post, BuzzFeed. My recommendation would be to actually, when you get out of school, try to go where the stories are. Really focus on reporting. You can always come back. The world's become much smaller than you know, when I was here um, at the J School. What's going to end up happening, and this is a very honest admission, what's going to end up happening if you are an international student and stay here is you're going to end up doing a few things that you really don't want to be doing. But you do it because you really want to be here. But your goal, after you know, spending so much money and time and you know, really wanting to be a journalist is to go out and write stories because you know, that, that saying, you're only as good as your last byline, still stands. So you want to make sure, your goal should be to go report. So whether you find a job here you know, reporting for a local newspaper or you know, it, it's, it's in Canada or India, wherever it is, I would actually recommend doing that. Thanks. Hi. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, is there anything that you wish you had learned at Columbia that has popped up in the field over the past five, seven years? Um, so a lot of the things that have sort of popped up are more sort of like the technological challenges. And I think like, you know, I've been lucky that, you know, I've, I've been able to adapt to those changes because outside of the office job, we still sort of get to do a little bit of professional development. Um, the thing that I actually regret not doing here, like I said earlier, was doing more sort of narrative writing. Because um, end of the day, when you get to a newsroom, you're, you're, you know, you're thrown out in the field. You'll have to write. And if the editor has time, um, you know, good editors will spend time with your story and your story will read, read well. Otherwise, you know, what you write is going to get copy edited and put out there. So what I would actually advise is to sort of focus more on those storytelling and reporting classes here. And I think, you know, the, the, the range of classes have been sort of expanded now, like, you know, uh, classrooms talk about how to sort of write for the web, for example. You have um, uh, adjunct professors who are working in the industry right now coming and teaching you how you can write for the Atlantic, how to write a business story by actually, you know, sitting in a newsroom, and that's possible. Um, so I would try to take some of those classes. Hi. Um, Hi. For those of us who are very much determined to do international journalism, 
what kind of um, classes, skills, or opportunities should we focus on while in school or after graduation? Um, you know, I'll speak from a very newsroom sort of perspective. Um, the kind of people, let me first, you know, like explain what kind of people newsrooms hire these days to do internet. When you say international journalism, you want to be a foreign correspondent, kind, of, right? Yeah. So the kind of people we're looking for, there, there are two kinds. One who can sort of do something like, have you heard of world views? It's the Washington Post's foreign affairs blog. Um, can I pull this up here? So most of everything that's here, and this is one of the most popular blogs at the Washington Post, um, it's written by uh, two of my colleagues uh, who are in the newsroom. They're well versed in foreign affairs, um, you know, they've report, reported from other places before. But what they do is they sit and, you know, like, they think about what are the big stories you're going to cover every day. Um, and they either pick up the phone and make calls and report on them, or they try to synthesize the information that's already available. They talk to correspondents, get feeds from them, and they try to, basically our goal is to help make sense of the world by sort of, you know, being in Washington. That's one kind of sort of international reporters, you know, newsrooms are hiring. The other kind is the traditional ones who are gonna be out in the field. And to be very frank, you know, you need to have solid reporting chops for those kind of jobs. Uh, you know, if, if we're going to send you to Beijing, if we're going to send you to Cairo, uh, we want to make sure you've had the experience before for several years. Um, you've done some good reporting. You know, you know how you can write daily stories, but you know how to also sort of write news analysis and help, you know, give your readers a sense of why something is important that it happened. Um, so the classes that I took at Columbia that, that really helped me. Um, the con Covering conflicts, one of my favorite classes, obviously, because I wanted to report um, on conflicts. Uh, there is International Newsroom, um, Professor Ann Cooper's class. Uh, and that class is it's fascinating and it's evolved um, in the last couple of years because she's always trying to make students think about how technology has changed international reporting. And that's very important. You'll visit newsrooms. Um, you know, they actually bring you to Washington, um, go to the BBC or Al Jazeera, come to the Washington Post, uh, and they help you sort of think how newsrooms are changing international reporting. So that is another class that I would recommend. I don't think Professor Friedman's teaching here anymore, right? There was another international reporting class that I took, which was very helpful. Um, in that, we learned how to report on the UN. So we were telling stories from the UN perspective. You know, you have so much resources at the UN. So I think there are two or three great international reporting classes here that I would recommend. Go ahead. Oh, thank you for being here. Um, two questions. One, what is the learning curve like from transitioning from a student at Columbia to working? And two, do you have, what is your like craziest, most extreme story for when you had to do reporting? Um, the, the first one, uh, learning curve. I think, these days, these days it's actually going to be pretty easy when you, when you get out of school because I think, I mean, I, I come here to school a lot. Um, you're actually, you know, the reason why I said, you know, like you hear from a lot of young folks as well as sort of professors who've been in the profession for a long time, you're actually ready to go out and, you know, you know if you're going to get hired at the Atlantic to write about health, you know, maternal health, you'll probably be okay doing that. I don't think there is a big sort of challenge. I think the challenge is um, really trying to be disciplined um, in making sure you, you, you know, you're you able to apply the things that you learn here. Um, there's not a, you know, it's going to be like a newsroom, like I said, you know, like you, you when you're here, you're gonna pick up the phone, you're gonna make real calls, you're gonna write real stories. So for me, I don't think there was a big difference when I made transitions. Uh, what was the second question, the craziest, sorry? The craziest thing I've done. Um, uh, I think so. So the second time I went to Afghanistan, um, you know, the first time I went, we didn't get shot at, and I think there is this, you know, there's this like you don't see action when you're a conflict reporter. There's a little bit of disappointment. Um, don't quote me on that one. Um, so the second time I went, uh, I was with the British Gurkha soldiers, and we were on patrol 
early in the morning and um, we knew that we were going to get shot at. But let's just say that. They were like, okay, you are going to get attacked at this 300 meter sort of run, so you have to run fast. They don't know, they don't know how to shoot well, so you'll not get hit, but you'll have to run. Um, so I have almost 30 pounds of sort of body armor in my helmet and um, I'm obsessed with videos. I've always wanted to do a nice video. So I have this like huge camera with me um, and I know I have to write, uh, you know, so I'm trying to think, okay, I have one camera hanging here. I have a video camera separately. So the guy says, okay, I will run by you. You're going to run fast. And I said, okay, it's like, do not focus on shooting your video, just run. So as soon as I take the step right out of the mud thing, you start hearing gunfire. And the first thing I do is pause and do this. <laughs> as, if, as if 600, 700 meters away, I'm going to see the Taliban guy. Then I just jumped on the ground. The guy yelled at me, I jumped on the ground. And so for about 15, 20 minutes next, um, I didn't realize what I was doing. I was just so focused on making sure my shot was there on the camera. I didn't realize it was a firefight. And then I came back to the tent that night and I started looking at the video over and over again. And uh, that's when I said, I am not going to do this again. <laughs> so I haven't been to Afghanistan since. I, I decided to go report on uh, rape victims in Nepal after that. Your question, sir. Uh, how important would you say data journalism is in uh, today's newsroom and the newsroom moving forward? Um, I would say it's very important and it probably ranks you know, high up there with a lot of the other things that are happening in um, digital journalism these days. If you look at, uh, if you look at why, you know, I have to say Wonk Blog, which is very popular. I don't know if you've heard, anybody heard of the Wonk Blog. Wonk Blog was this thing that Ezra Klein um, was part of at the Washington Post. Um, it, was, it was sort of known for using charts and graphs and later GIFs or GIFs, however you want to pronounce those. Um, and you know, same thing, Quartz is doing its own sort of, you know, it's excelled in data journalism. They've uh, built their own tool that helps visualize data. Um, <clears throat> New York Times has Upshot that's focused more on sort of like looking at data and that kind of stuff. And I know Al Jazeera was hiring a lot of people, you know, who, who, who are good at sort of visualizing data. So I think, you know, if that's something that you're interested in, I would try to focus on reporting and then doing data. You know what I mean? Make that, give that as much importance as you would to, um, to, to reporting because you will need to learn how to sort of where to find that data, how to visualize it. And you know, many times the, the, the struggle in our newsrooms is, you know, it's always a struggle. It's like, does that story really need a, you know, a graphic, an infographic? Uh, do we really need to show this data in a different way um, kind of thing? Hi, thanks for joining us. Um, you were talking about making connections um, with your professors, and obviously Columbia is top name professors in a large alumni association. So how have you used that to propel yourself in the journalism industry and to gain connections in the journalism profession? Um, I am, um, you know, I'm, I'm still good friends with most of my professors here. Uh, and I think, you know, that that's probably because when I was at Columbia, I, I interacted with most of them on a very regular basis. Um, if you're willing and if you are able, they will maintain that relationship with you. So that has helped me. Um, you know, I'm constantly in touch with the, you know, folks at Career Services here. Um, you know, informing them if a position opens up at the Washington Post or the Atlantic for any any students who are looking for. Um, I'm in touch with professors here. You know, talking about hey, here's this new kind of stuff that we're doing. Maybe it will be helpful for students to see it. And at the same time, um, you know, I hear from professors. Um, so, and you know, that's obviously helped me. Like, this. I emailed um, Judith Matloff, who was uh, my covering conflicts professor before I went to Afghanistan. And after I came back from Afghanistan, basically asking, what should I do, or what have I done wrong, or how should I get better? And you know, they're always they're always happy to happy to answer those questions because I think. Um, there's this sense that you know when you when you come here you're part of this community and you know they are proud of you as much as you know you should be proud of your school so that that relationship is mutual so I've benefited a lot from that. Any other questions? Sure. So in your profession working with all different types of journalists from all over the world, different trainings, self-taught, different schools. What about Columbia? 
do you think sets you apart from everybody else? I think, and, and it's funny because, you know, like when, I, when I'm in the newsroom and I ask a lot of people where'd you go to school, even folks who went to school in the 60s and 70s, they said like, oh, I actually went to journalism school. Um, so I do run into a lot of sort of, a lot of folks who are in sort of top places or, you know, they have been to Columbia. But the thing that sets us apart, I think, is really the kind of coaching that you get here. Um, you know, I, I couldn't speak for another sort of school's uh, training. But the thing that really helped me here is um, I was able to think like a journalist, not like a student when I was here. And um, when I was taking classes, I wasn't studying theory. Like I said, you know, like you, we weren't discussing how somebody covered Vietnam. We were actually covering it, and that's matter. You know, like you'll see it in the newsroom. Um, when young folks sometimes come and write, it's very theory, you know, like you're writing it as an essay, as a paper for your class, not as an article, and it shows. So I think the benefit, uh, the difference in coming here, like, you know, dif something that sets you apart is that you're actually a journalist when you're here. You're not a student, and you'll be expected to behave and write like a journalist, perform like a journalist. Does that make sense? Um, so there's just... I had Oh, oh there's just so, so much happening right now around the world and I feel like if you want to cover foreign affairs or anything international, it's kind of hard to know where to start. Right. Um, and I was wondering, is it more important now to have maybe one area, one country, one topic that you specialize in or should you really try to know a bit about or as much as you can about everything and just be as general as possible? I think probably more of the first, but, but with a little bit of sort of, um, you, you will need to know how the world functions. For example, if you want to cover uh, Islamic State or sort of like the rising sort of, you know, uh, threats of Islamic State in the Middle East, you will also want to know what's driving all these young people from Europe to go, you know, fight for the Islamic State. So you will have to learn a little bit about poverty, a little bit about that disenchantment and racism that they may be facing and a lot of you know a lot of people say that's one of the reasons so I think y you want to be in that zone where you're learning everything right but you still want to pick what you want to do because you don't want to spread yourself much thin. maybe you want to go report from Nairobi right maybe you want to report on maternal health or <clears throat> maybe you want to report on women's issues in India um, you can pick these specific things but you know end of the day you will have to the biggest thing now is, you know, it's not just about writing a story, it's telling readers why it matters. Nobody's going to click on, think about, think about why people would click on your story. That's how I think, whether it's on your phone, on your watch, on your laptop, whatever it is, um, why would somebody click on your story? Because you will have to tell them, probably with a clever headline, why that story matters. Okay. I had a really similar question. Um, I've had a couple editors and mentors tell me, yeah, you can go to journalism school, you'll be able to hone your craft, but you won't have any kind of expertise in any subject area. Um, so how much do you feel like this experience was able to kind of give you an expertise that you, that beyond storytelling that was able to help you? You know, I mean, you, you spend less than a year here, right? Uh, you're learning the craft of reporting, storytelling. Um, and knowledge is something I, you know, like I said, like, you know, you're still going to, like, because I wanted to sort of report on Afghanistan, I was reading a lot outside of my classroom. It wasn't a required reading, but I was reading the New York Times covers, I was reading the Washington Post covers, I was reading historic books. So I think that knowledge and beat stuff is something that you will have to do on your own as well. But there are resources here that can sort of help you with it. Right? There may have been professors who can connect you with people. Um, who know things. I know like several of uh, my, my friends who later um, did some work for the New York Times because they wanted to cover conflict and um, they were connected with uh, CJ Shivers and um, you know Cliff Levi who had covered um, Moscow and Afghanistan for some time. Um, so you'll make those connections, you'll learn from people and but you know the knowledge matter, subject matter is something you'll also have to take on yourself. Yes. Um, so you just spoke a little bit about kind of clickability and, and um, what I would say is probably like audience development sort of stuff. And I'm, I'm wondering um, to what degree audience development and reporting um, is intertwined in your job um, and just what you've seen from journalism school graduates as well, if they have to have both those skills or if they're still sort of two separate things. 
Right. Um, audience development and reporting, you said. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I see reporting as sort of something very different than a skill set, which is audience development, right? Audience development is this mindset that you, you have to know that people have to engage with your story. So there are a couple of ways of doing that. Um, in newsrooms, we, we look at, okay, uh, how, can, how, how can we increase the number of readers or our audience? One, through social media, obviously. How do we promote stories? Images are important. So that, that mindset sort of needs to be there. The conversation needs to happen. Um, photos are very important for audience engagement. Headlines are very important for audience engagement, right? A good sort of blurb, a subject matter, how you sort of, you know, show it in your tweet is important. But all those things are sort of going to come when you write a good story. I'm working on a project that's, go, you know, well, I, I can't talk about what I'm working on. I worked on a project on Cuba uh, last week. Uh, we had this uh, poll. It was a rare poll that um, Univision did uh, um, in collaboration with the Washington Post. And we wrote a story. But the challenge was like, okay, polls are boring. How do we get people to read these polls, right? We write a story um, and sort of pick things from there that you think audience is going to really you know, grasp on. So although the polls showed that Cubans were disenchanted with the Castros and you know, they, you know, many of them would leave, um, the thing that was very interesting, one of the things that I wanted to pick on was Cubans gave a higher approval rating to President Obama at 80% 80, 80 than to their own leaders at like 44 and 47%. And that was very telling, right? So we wanted to pick that because what, what happens then is you're, you're, you're capturing the American audience as well as sort of like the international audience. So it sort of goes simultaneously. We ask reporters to think about how they will engage with the audience when they write a story. There is a field they're required to sort of fill. It's like, okay, what is your social headline going to be? This will be, you know, this is, this is going to be a print headline, sure. But what is, how are you going to pitch this story to you? What is the idea of your story? So we're constantly thinking about those things. Hi. Hi. Um, while you've been out on the field, how imperative has it been for you to know the language of the country that you're in or the language of the people that you're working with? That's a great question. Uh, I think it is very important and there are two ways to deal with it. One, if you're sort of like, you know, if you're, if you're a freelancer and you're working on a very small budget, it's kind of hard. So. I've always recommended to, to friends and folks who've, who've asked me these questions to pick countries that you're comfortable reporting in or that your you know, budget um, allows you to do because without that, your reporting is one, not going to be strong, two, it's not safe, right? You don't want to be in either of those situations. If you're working for a big newsroom, that is not much of a problem. You know, it helps obviously, but you know, if you're working for the Times, if you're working for the Journal Post, you will have resources to help you. You can hire a translator, you can hire assistants in your newsroom to do those things. But as a young journalist um, who probably wants to start out on something, if, if you have aspirations to do that, I would say language is important. Um, I went to Afghanistan because I knew Urdu, um, although you know, not all Afghans um, um, speak Urdu. I was in the southern part, which was bordered with Pakistan, so I knew that people there would speak Urdu, and I chose that um, as you know one of the first places that I would go to. Um, yeah. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, if you have any questions, you saw my website, but um, I will I will just offer my email, which I do with. Um, most students. It's uh, my full name, anupkathle at gmail.com. Feel free to ask me any questions that you may have um, and wish you all the best. Thank you. Good? Like him? He's an okay guy.
I also failed to mention that we should collectively congratulate uh, Anoop on his impending wedding in December in, um, in Nepal, so he'll be breaking a lot of hearts. I'd like to bring up to uh, the stage now um, someone you, some of you met yesterday, Melanie Huff, who is our Associate Dean for Student Services, who will walk through some of the student life issues that you should know about. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, you can start thinking of me now as the woman who will be emailing you constantly. Um, because I sort of coordinate everything that sort of makes your life run as a student. Um, and the first thing you will hear from me about are immunizations. So once you have committed to coming here, you'll start hearing from me. Because um, the New York State law requires a lot of immunizations. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about right now. What I want to sort of translate for you, you're getting a, a really strong sense from faculty, students, and of course a noob, um, about how different a, a, an educational experience this is um, compared to what you're used to um, in more traditional programs. Um, and what's important about this is, as uh, Anoop was saying, you're treated like a, a working journalist from day one. What we do here is to create real works of journalism with you know, editors and professors who are really giving you a lot, a lot of feedback in a way that you wouldn't get in an actual newsroom. But the standard here is, is one of a professional setting. Um, and as such, it is not an option, as it was sometimes in undergrad, um, to wake up one morning and it's a beautiful day and you think, I'm going to go sit under a tree and I'll get the notes from somebody else. Right? That's not the way it works here. It's like a job. If you wake up and you feel sick, then you call in sick and you let your professor and my office know in advance of missing the class. Okay, so it's just like a job in that respect. You, you need to check in with us, you need to know, and part of this has to do with the fact that we've got live websites, live shows, things going, going out, um, and you've, we've, we've got to make up for your absence if you cannot be there. Okay, so that, it, that's a very different kind of thing than a traditional um, sort of educational situation. There's very little that's passive here. There's very little time where you're going to be sitting in a room and taking some notes. We don't do exams, for instance. There's not a reading week, there's not an exam week. Everything here is around producing works of journalism. Um, and so this is just a really important thing for you to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that, that exists pretty much in, in a traditional setting is you'll have a class from, let's say, 9 to 11.30 on Mondays. And then the rest of your time, you know, and you'll have homework for that class, but you sort of decide when you're going to do that homework and you're sort of in control of your schedule. Um, you can count on pretty much being involved with your journalism school work, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and then frequently in the evenings as well. Okay, so it, it is, it's a very um, time-intensive program. Um, it is a program where your schedule changes frequently. Um, and so you just need to, to be really good at time management, and you need to be flexible, and you need to expect um, that when there's breaking news, your professor may well call you up and say, you know, you need to go cover that. Um, so that's just one of the things that you, you need to, to keep in mind. Um, it's a very, um, it, it's very demanding and you need to be very flexible. Um, the other thing that, that, is, that is very different, and you've probably started to get a sense of this from a noop, is the amount of interaction you have um, with your faculty and even with, you know, your, your deans and whatnot. It's small, it's intense, it's interactive. It is not one of those things where um, you might go to office hours once in a while, right? This is a, a constant back and forth between you and your professor slash editors in real time. So you're out in the Bronx, you're supposed to be filming something, and it's pouring with rain. What do you do? You're out in, the, in, in Brooklyn and the source goes missing. What do you do? You call your editor right then and you discuss how you're going to handle that situation. Okay? It is, it is that kind of, of, of constant back and forth between you and your faculty. If you do not engage in that, one, you will not do well here, two, you're missing out 
on a big component of the learning process. The learning process happens when you in, encounter difficulties in your reporting and then you, you, you reach out and you, you figure out with your professor how you're going to handle it. So it is, it is one of those things you need to be prepared for that level of, of interaction. You cannot go missing. Um, we have, you know, we have very, um, you know, unfortunately as well, though, you can't put your life on hold. You will be sick for some days and you will have, you know, problems that come up. You have to let us know. We can't work with you and we can't work around these things unless we know what's going on. So it's a bit of a joke, but not really. When I say there's no such thing as TMI, everybody know what that means? At the journalism school, right? We need to, to know. And I know some people are like, well, I don't want to talk about my deep, dark, and meaningfuls with the you know, deans and faculty. We're not asking you to, to tell us your deep, dark, and meaningfuls, but we are asking you to let us know when there's something going on in your life that is going to, that's going to impede your ability um, to, to get the work done, because we, we need to work with you. And to give you a sense too, let's say in a traditional class you have over the course of a semester a couple of quizzes, a midterm exam, and maybe a final exam and, and a, a, a long written piece. You're going to have weekly, every, it, there are going to be constant deadlines. You're, every week b between your different classes, you're going to have three and four deadlines, right? You're going to have, a, the work is constant. And the assignments are constant, and some of them are small projects, some of them are in-depth projects, but it, it, it is a constant um, flow of, of deadlines coming at you all the time, which means that it's very, you know, if you, if you can't make something, then you can get really far behind very quickly. So you need to, to whenever anything comes up, you've got to let us know. So it's all very much about interacting with us um, in, a, in a constant kind of way. Okay, it's, it's, it's very collaborative. Everything here we do is collaborative. And a lot of the projects are teamwork with your, your, your classmates as well, which is another reason that everybody's got to be on the same page and coordinating with times and, and that kind of thing. Um, in general, my office um, provides the, the sort of liaison services between um, the things that are handled centrally by the university, which would be health services, the gym, um, trying to think what else is it? housing these are things that the university runs and we're sort of you know run interference um, when there when when problems arise um, it's also this office that that handles registration um, and add drop and all sorts of, of of processing how many of you are internationals I know a lot of uh, watching the live stream are you'll have lots of paperwork um, they'll ask for stamps and things that's my office um, if you're Fulbrights, so you'll have paperwork. That's my office. So when in doubt, it's probably my office. Um, we handle all the, the paperwork. Um, my uh, office also oversees the uh, student groups. Um, we have a lot of different affinity groups. Um, we also uh, have a, a student government here, which is uh, our, cha our local chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. That comes out of, of, of my office. Um, and we're basically, you know, the first stop for whenever anything is not quite functioning. <laughs> um, you, come, you, you, you come to us. So that is, that is what my office does. And um, we, we try to be really, really responsive to students. And you need to be interacting with us on a regular basis, too. Again, you're going to meet a lot of, of deans over the next couple of days. It's not the case that you're going to see us now. You'll see us on opening day, and then you'll never lay eyes on us again until graduation. That's not the case. We are all actively involved with everything going on here from day one. Um, and that's, that's part of the benefit, is you're getting a lot of support and hands-on um, interaction, but you've got to work with us. So the, the main thing is you never can go missing. You've got you've to always stay in touch. Okay? Um, questions? Questions? Here's one. Here's a question. All right, so... I plan on staying in uh, Jersey around a 45 minute uh, bus ride without any uh, traffic and a 20 minute subway ride uh, to Columbia. Do you think that would be much of a hindrance, that much travel? Yes. Too much hindrance? Yes. Right. If, 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 it, if it's at all possible, I would not be in New Jersey. If there's any conceivable <laughs> way, I would not be in New Jersey. Um, and I would not be way far out in, in, in Queens or Brooklyn either. You, it is far preferable 
to be in Manhattan. Um, if you need to be outside of Manhattan, as, you know, as close as, as close to Manhattan as you, you can be. It really is. Um, it really is very difficult. People are in this building 24/7. There are a lot of late nights editing. Um, it can, you know, there's a lot of bad weather here at certain times of the year. You can get stuck here, stuck there, um, and professors don't have any time. No use for 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 coming late, ever. I mean, so I, yes, I would say that you should try not to do that if at all possible. Other questions? Nothing? No questions? Yeah, no questions about how your life is going to run. Oh, I see, see, Dean Souders is going to ask a question. Because I know there were several of you that I talked with last night who I said specifically, ask Dean Huff tomorrow morning. There was a question, Melanie, about um, the class schedules and how they work. And I know that you've mentioned that it's not like the tr traditional um, university class schedules, but maybe if you could talk a little bit more about what the hours per day okay. might actually be like. So how many of you are Master of Science? Okay, so I'm going to talk about Master of Science first. Um, how many of you are full-time Master of Science? Okay, so basically, um, here's, here's the first part of it. Your schedule in August will be different than your schedule the first seven weeks of the academic, the traditional academic term. Then you'll have a week that's just for the master's project. And then you'll have a final seven weeks doing totally different things. So your schedule is going to change all the time. It's four weeks, then seven weeks, then one week, then another seven weeks. So your schedule is going to change all the time. Um, the important thing to know is that this is it's like job kind of hours. I mean, you're basically going to need to be here all day, every day. Um, we can, you know, drill down on that. But, um, and when you're not in class, you may well have a, you know, so you might have a class from 9 to 12, but then have a 5 o'clock deadline for work for that class, right? So even though the class is ended, you've got to go out in the field to do the reporting to create the piece that is due then at 5. And then you might have something else that evening. So it is, it is really, really um, intense. Um, so, and it changes all the time. So that was, that's sort of the flexibility that I was referring to um, earlier. You, ne you need to be able to handle that. Yes? Um, in regards to um, sort of living by campus and everything that you were talking about earlier, um, do most student, graduate students live in the graduate school housing or um, off campus, or how does that process work? Okay, so the, the, um, most people live in the neighborhood. Most people do not live in university housing. Um, the university housing system uh, basically gives each of the graduate programs a certain number of spots that we can say, please house that person. Uh, we have no say in what kind of housing, the cost of the housing, or the location of the housing. All we can say is, please house this person. So how do we decide which person to house? We do that based on distance that the, the person lives from the university. So basically, if you're living in, in India, you're, you're most likely going to get a, a housing offer um, because of the, the, the distance from, from campus and also the fact that people who need um, visas to come here um, don't have the opportunity to come here early to apartment hunt, which is why we pri prioritize um, the housing offers by distance. Um, of the somewhere in the ballpark of 300 students, uh, new students that will be enrolling in the fall, I'm going to have 85, 90 beds, right? So there's no way that, that most of you are going to, to get university housing. Pretty much, if you are a, a United States citizen living in the U.S., you're not going to get um, you're not going to get a housing offer. Um, that said, the, most people do uh, and are successful in finding housing that is on the west side of Manhattan, and that is the the, the best case scenario for where you should be living. Uh, thanks for speaking with us today. Barring any breaking news stories that we have to go out 
to cover quickly. How much, generally speaking, advance notice do we have? Like, I'm going to cover this here on Thursday, so I can probably like get an hour of gym time in the morning and then do everything else. Just uh, how how much how far in advance can we plan out our our days, our weeks? Not very. But that said, it depends on, you know, what time of the year. As I said, for instance, in the fall semester, what you're doing keeps changing. Um, and certain uh, portions of that are more highly structured than others. Um, August is pretty highly structured, so that, that you, you will definitely know. Um, the reporting class is a little bit less so, and that's, you know, you're, you're the predominant thing that you're doing um, in that, that first seven weeks of the academic, um, uh, the regular academic year that starts in September. Um, again, you know, it, it depends. Some professors do do day book stories, and you might not get that until, you know, right before you have to go out. Um, so it depends on the professor, it depends on the time of year, um, but again, you need, a, you need a lot of flexibility. Um, and, you know, also, some of this will be dependent, too, on the stories. At a certain point, um, after you, you, you sort of get your sea legs, as it were, you, you know, you'll be in the position to be pitching some of the stories, and some of that will, will come into play in terms of those locations and those hours of the availability of the sources and that kind of thing. Yes? What's available to us, like, around campus in terms of, let's say, volleyball, a volleyball club or... Um, something like that? Um, there are lots of, of things. You, you'll find out about most of them beginning in September rather than August because in, in August, I mean, it's kind of a cool thing. You get the whole campus to yourself, um, but it's before the rest of the students have arrived and none of those things have kicked in yet. Um, during the, the orientation, though, you'll get a briefing from the people in the gym. There's like formal classes. There are intramurals. There are all sorts of, of, of things like that. Um, our students don't find a whole lot of time for those, but, but there is, there, there's certainly lots of them on offer. Other questions? Anything? Okay. <laughs> um, about selecting courses, how much of it is finite curriculum and how much is elective and then for me I'm actually in the Master of Arts so is that much more specified? Okay so actually in both programs there are a number of core courses that you're just registered for. You will just arrive and be registered for. As a Master of Arts student you will arrive, you will be in your, you will be pre-registered for your seminar, your, your thesis, um, evidence and inference and then there will be a few things about which you need to make choices. For the Master of Science students, the reporting class, you, you will arrive and be registered for. You will arrive and already have a master's project advisor. Um, there will be a couple of classes, that your written word class in the fall semester and your image and sound class in the fall semester that you will be making a choice about. Um, and in the spring semester, you will be making a choice about two seminar and discipline uh, classes. Um, and then the timing of your audience and engagement class. Um, so there are the choices that you have to make are, are big and important choices, but there's a fair number of things that are automatic registration. Yes? How frequently do students not get into classes that they want to be in, and what happens if that happens? Well, we're very clear with people, and I'm going to be very clear right now, that we make no promises that anybody is going to get into any particular class. And if you are uh, coming here with, this, you know, with the goal in mind of getting into a particular class, it's not a promise we can make. Um, that we make every effort to offer, you know, we have a wide variety of things. Um, we definitely take into account the interests that you, you express um, we do surveys periodically, you know, who wants to take this before we schedule things and so on and so forth. So we make every effort um, to, to make sure that people get the skills that they want, um, but not necessarily in the exact class that they want. There's no, there's no school on the planet that can promise you that. We, we, we do our best, though, to make sure that you, that you have the opportunity to get to learn what it is you came here to learn. Other questions? Yes. 
So for those of us in the full-time schedule, obviously this is a, a different kind of year-round curriculum. What, what sort of holidays are we acknowledging and celebrating? Okay. <laughs> Not many. No. We don't do holidays. Okay, so let me, let me talk about vacations and holidays. The, the, the rule is this, you never, you never miss class for any reason except an emergency or health or religious observance. So if you are observing, um, depending on when these fall, if you are observing Eid, um, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, uh, Good Friday, you know, the, the, the sort of big religious holidays, you are allowed to miss class for those. Classes are not canceled for any of them. Um, you are allowed to miss, miss class for them. Uh, you have to notify your professor in advance that you are observant of that particular holiday and make um, plans in advance about um, what you're going to do to make up that work. Um, there are a number of Monday bank holidays. We don't get them. So Columbus Day, President's Day, um, the only one out of the whole lot that, we, that, that the university does observe is Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, but all the other bank holiday Mondays, we don't observe them. Um, the university also uh, has a, a first week of November, has a Monday and Tuesday off. It's the Monday before election day and election day. The university, every, all the other students are off those two days. We're in business those two days. Um, among the reasons that the journalism school many, many moons ago opted to be open those days is that elections, elections are news stories. You're going to be out covering uh, elections. So, of course, we're in business those days. Um, we do get Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving Friday off. Um, <laughs> the, um, and, you know, as, as far as... as um, uh, the, the winter break goes, uh, a good portion of that, and we'll discuss this more later, is devoted to reporting on either your master's project or your master's thesis. So, you know, for this, this time chunk, your, your commitment really is to the, the journalism school, um, but what you have to remember is you're getting a master's degree in a very short period of time, so for, you know, that nine months or ten months that you're here, this is your world, and you will love it. You'll be exhausted, but you'll have a great time. Other questions? Yes. Um, I'm from out of state. Um, how much time in advance do you suggest I come here and find a place to stay? Um, you know, it, it's hard to, to, I mean, you can do some of it long distance, um, but it's hard to, to take a place much in advance of a month. Um, so I would say if, if you need to be here, um, depending on which degree program, you know, first week of August, first week of July is a reasonable amount of, of, of time. But you may be able to do, you know, there's a lot of, how many of you are on the Facebook page? Okay, so the, a, a lot, a lot of what that's used for over the summer is people saying, okay, some, you know, buddy who's more local, I found a great place, I need a couple of roommates, contact me. So there's a lot of, of that kind of thing that, that goes on. Um, also, if you use the, the off-campus housing registry, which is listed in the, the um, housing packet that we sent you, there are a lot of, of people in the neighborhood who rent only to Columbia students. Um, they list their apartments only with the university because they want Columbia students. Um, and so, you know, checking that out because the dates are sometimes a little more flexible there. Um, and as far as employment, um, do you think it's a good idea to even get a job or a part-time? It's almost impossible. Okay. It's almost impossible. Largely because, one, you're just so busy. Um, and two, it's very difficult with, with the, the, the way the hours of the program keep changing and that need to be flexible for reporting. Um, you know, very few people pull it off. Those who do are sort of, you know, looking at, at 10 hours a week, probably on the weekends. Hi, um, I'm going to be a part-time student specializing in investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I haven't done enough investigation yet, but I couldn't locate where the <laughs> courses are going to be in the schedule and uh, how many credits these uh, investigative journalism courses okay. are going to be worth. So here, here's the thing about the way that the school is structured. Yes, you have to accumulate a certain number of credits, but credit accumulation is not the, the operating principle here. There are required courses um, that you, you have to take depending on, on your, your area of, of specialization. And if you take those, you will have enough points. So when it comes to the Stabile class, 
Um, there is a, a, a Stabile Skills class and a, um, that's offered in the fall semester. There is um, a Stabile, the Stabile students do a Stabile investigative master's project. Um, there's also a Stabile seminar and a Stabile workshop in the spring semester. So it's, there are requirements rather than specific point accumulations. Um, do people ever burn out? And if they do, what happens in those instances? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, we, we, yes, I mean, sometimes it, it is really, really intense. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we can do is, once you're enrolled, um, it, it's difficult at the onset to, to move back and forth between part-time and full-time, but once you're, you're part of the mix, um, so let's say, you, you're, you're enrolled here for the first semester and you love it, but oh my gosh, you're so worn out. You know that you can't take another semester at that pace. The second semester, you could conceivably slow down to, to a part-time schedule going forward. Okay, perfect. As long as, yes, it is, it is yeah. It, the, 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 the problem area is international students. Your student visa is, is dependent on your being full-time enrolled. Um, the only, the option there would be to take a semester off and then come back. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, are we graded or is it pass-fail? The school is pass-fail. Um, there are some um, internal designations that professors can give you. Um, so, grading. It's a pass-fail school. What will appear on your transcript is the list of P's. Fingers crossed. It's a list of P's next to the classes that you, you take. That is all that's going to appear on your official transcript. Um, because it's a pass-fail school, in order for you to really have a sense of how you're doing, um, the vast majority of classes, you will get a written evaluation from your professor at the end of that class uh, with a very detailed um, explanation of how you did, your strengths, your weaknesses, what you should work on going forward, and so forth. On that form, they can opt to give a certain number of students an honors in class designation. They can also, on that form, um, indicate a low pass designation, but those are unofficial designations that exist within the, the, that, the, the system of the evaluations. They do not appear on your official transcript. And that is for the Master of Science program. Hi, this has been incredibly helpful. Programs like Courseworks or um, registration, are, is that available after you pay the enrollment fee or after you pay tuition? Um, Courseworks, I think you can log in. It, it, it's all after you, you've paid the enrollment fee. Um, I will tell you that, that we don't use some of these systems as extensively as they do in some of the other departments. So for instance, you could easily you know, be looking for information on a class in Courseworks, and it might not be there. Um, the evaluations will be there, but the professor may not be opting to post a syllabus there, um, again, because it's such an untraditional program. So you know, we go over some of this with you, but it, it, did you take another degree at Columbia? No, no? okay. Because uh, anybody else have another degree from Columbia? Okay, just so you know, nothing we do, including registration, will be remotely familiar. Um, <laughs> we do things totally differently, our calendar is different, we kind of drive them nuts. Um, but anyhow, access to the systems is based on the enrollment fee and the activation of your uni. All right, so we're out of time. Let me say this to you. I will be in my office today from 10.30 to 12. Um, that's 207C. Um, I will be at the info fair down the hall in the, the Pulitzer room, World Room from 12.15 to 2. So if you have any questions you want to ask me one-to-one, -one, that's how to find me. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Huff. She speaks fast and she speaks loud. And you will get a lot of emails from her. So get your shots before you come. I would like to um, introduce you to Julie Hartenstein. Julie is our Associate Dean for Career Services. Uh, we've told you about a lot of things that you join when you come here. <coughs> a network of alumni, a network of 
fellow students with many different types of life experiences and uh, work past work histories uh, that you sit next to and learn a lot from. Uh, and one of the things that you also become part of is a network of people who will help you through your career in many different ways. What the Career Services Office does here, uh, we think better than anyone else in the world for many reasons, is to help you prepare for a career when you leave here. Um, Julie has that office with a team of really great people and she will walk you through what that means. Good morning. You guys have been sitting here for a long time. Do you want to take a 30 second stretch, jump around? Is everybody okay? Okay. I want to give you a quick overview of our career services department and how we prepare you for life after journalism school to compete in the job market and to land jobs. Probably won't have too much time for questions in this um, section, so I've tried to anticipate and answer as many questions as I can in my presentation. I'll also be available from one to three. You have it on your schedule. My office is above the Stabil Center where you'll have lunch. Uh, my office is terribly hot today um, since it's such a beautiful day, so I may relocate, but you'll know where to find me. I'd also be delighted to speak to you further at any point if you have questions in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to refer to my notes, I think, today a little more than usual so I can move quickly. You're going to compare a lot of things in thinking about whether or not to come to journalism school and whether or not Columbia is right for you. But when it comes to career services, the bottom line is that there's no comparison. We're the best in the business. And I'm a pretty modest person, so it's kind of hard for me to say that, but it's true. We provide the most hands-on service to individual students offer the most resources with the most professional staff, and we put on the largest journalism fair in the country, in fact, the world, period. This is the J School, so I'm going to, you better get used to it. We're gonna work with the W's, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Who, our career services team is a team of three and a half. We've all had careers as practicing journalists in the field and graduate educators. That means that we come to the J School with a lot of experience and contacts in the industry. When we talk to employers, we speak their language, and that pays off for you in jobs and opportunities for our grads. Quick profile of our team. I spent 20 years as a producer with ABC News in New York. I taught at the J School here for seven years, broadcast journalism, and I've been, I specialize in working with those of you who want to specialize in broadcast, radio, television, and digital production, hands on. Our associate director, Gina Bubion, uh, does have a degree, master's degree from the competition at Medill. Uh, she taught for seven years at NYU and she specializes in working with students in you know, primarily text-based, uh, alt-weeklies, magazines, newspapers, and print. She spent uh, 15 years as a newspaper reporter, a couple of uh, publications across the country. Elena Cabral, who a number of you have probably already met, is also the director of our part-time program. She's a J School alum. She's uh, taught extensively here, and she worked at the Miami Herald and a couple of other places uh, for a number of years. And our program administrator, Isabella Rutkowski, is a 2013 grad of the J School, knows the program, and has done uh, internships and worked at a variety of media outlets. So as you can see, we bring a lot of journalism experience, uh, expertise, and context to the table uh, to help you launch and further your careers in journalism. What? What do we do? We're very hands-on and we get to know our students. This is not like your undergraduate career services where they don't know your name and the only people that come to the career expos are uh, or the you know, fairs or Coca-Cola, the military, and uh, the post office. And that's no offense to the post office. Uh, they have good benefits. Uh, every student adopts a career services counselor based on their interests. Uh, we have the opportunity to meet with, or you have the opportunity to meet with us for a long consult where we get to know you. Uh, we overhaul your resume, we work on your cover letters, we help you plan a career strategy, and we suggest a lot of targets of opportunity for you. After that, our doors are always open 24-7, uh, and we're here to answer questions throughout the year. When do we work with you? That's a process that is constant. This is not an ivory tower where we just, you know, sort of sit on this lovely, uh, lovely hill and, uh, and look out at the landscape of journalists. journalism. As you know, um, have, have already heard uh, from Manoop and other people, we are very hands-on. In our department alone, we've had 60 sessions this year. 
uh, journalists, recruiters, employers, and media entrepreneurs, and that's just career services. We help you figure out what you bring to the table. We help each of you translate your and market your prior experience and what you bring to the table and how you can be competitive in, in the marketplace. There's no one size fits all. We, help, we have a lot of resources to help you in this process. Um, you know, some of them are based on the web, a lot of it is one-on-one. Is -on -one. We help you with resumes, with digital portfolios, with how to um, use social media in, in the job search. We have sessions on freelancing coming up, and a lot of our grads are starting their own businesses. So those are all topics we address either in our office, again, 60 sessions to date, um, we also hold a lot of mock interview sessions. Uh, most people, how, how many of you are comfortable doing interviews right now? Oh, you're being, uh, really? Um, anyway, so you don't need that, but most people, a lot, a lot of people do, and we help you to nail that, uh, nail that conversation. On the career education front, which is really part of our job, our curriculum covers a lot of terrain. We bring in lots of companies to um, tell you about their newsrooms, what it is that they're looking for. Sometimes they do interviews on campus. We call them meet the media sessions. Just to name you know, a couple of the 60, we've had BBC, Bloomberg, New York Times, Time Inc., Bustle, Mick, um, Univision, Vice, and the Wall Street Journal. That's just um, a handful. We also have as you'll hear more about, an amazing alumni network. We bring, we do a session called, a um, series of sessions called View from the Trenches. And that's where alums come in, these are off the record, and you know, they speak candidly about their career path, their employers, and they really give you the lowdown about, you know, what their trajectory has been like since J school. Career services is not just our department. There are so many guests in this building, you can see them on the, on the schedules and sessions, you know, in your classes, in New York City, at the J School, events in this building and throughout the neighborhood that you couldn't possibly go to a fraction of them, even at the J School, and still graduate on time. In other words, uh, this place is one giant networking opportunity, and the big Megillah uh, was held just two weeks ago right across the, uh, the, the lawn in that big glass center, uh, the student center called Lerner Hall, and that's our career expo. Two weeks ago, I'm still recovering, uh, two weeks ago, yeah, Saturday. Today, yeah, exactly two weeks ago. We had 300 recruiters and 144 companies join us. We were subscribed beyond capacity. It's very painful to have to turn a couple people away, a couple of employers away. And all these people came just to meet the class of 2015. I think we've got the, yeah, yeah, those are, those are the, uh, those are the companies that came. Again, um, all journalism companies. Uh, it wasn't IBM and it wasn't um, uh, Target. Lots of big names in legacy were here. You can see the names, the Washington Post, New York Times, all the broadcast outlets, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, NBC, newspapers, magazines, digital outlets, tons of digital properties from BuzzFeed to Vice and new outlets that really may be the, uh, the next hot thing. You know, five years ago when we were looking at BuzzFeed and they were just doing, uh, you know, cat listicles, we wouldn't have known that they have an investigative unit at this point as well as a data unit. Uh, Blue Chalk was here, the Dodo, how many of you have heard of Dodo? Well, if you love animals and love wildlife, then, uh, then, then you would have been excited to meet with, with Dodo. Uh, Vocative and Now News are some other, no, other new targets. It's very exciting for us because, you know, we're going after new companies, you know, every year and even people, you know, employers that we know well look around the room every year and they don't even recognize half of, not half, but a lot of the companies that are coming and that's very exciting for us and it's exciting for you. Uh, I want to give you a quick glimpse of the expo. We turned this video around this week just to give you a, uh, a, a peek. Um, so I think we have that handy to play. <clears throat> I knew it was going to be a big event, but I think once the doors open and you get past uh, the name tags, it's it was a lot bigger of a production than I thought it would be. <laughs> oh no. We'll try it one more time.
We also have a version from a couple years ago on the, uh, on the website, but I wanted to show you what's current. I knew it was going to be a big event, but I think once the doors open and you get past uh, the name tags, it's, it's a lot bigger of a production than I thought it'd be. The Career Expo is a great way to meet people, to connect and network. The career fair, it's really crazy. Feels like speed dating. I think it's also a great warm introduction to the employers. Tell me a little bit about some of your strongest skill sets. So, so far, I've been doing print and digital, but I also really love creating videos for web. Many of them asked about data and social media. They are also asking about how you find the stories. When you talk about your clips or something, they really want to know, so how did you find it? Which sources did you talk to? The good thing about our school is that we really get all aspects of it. Really, the people that we're looking for can do anything. We're coming up with the ideas. We're doing the pre-reporting. We're like finding the sources. We're shooting. We're editing. We've traveled a long way to get here, but it's been worth it because we found at least three or four people I think I would be willing to hire. The ESPN's here every year just because the candidates are so impressive, like I said. I feel like everyone that I sit down with, I'm blown away. What a great fit a lot of Columbia people have been at ESPN is what keeps us coming back. Well, I've been going strong since 9 o'clock this morning. I had about eight or nine interviews. My interview to places like Bloomberg TV, Yahoo News, CNN Money. Everyone here was just so welcoming and friendly and wanting to talk to us and find out more about us as students and what our skill sets are so they can figure out a good match. I've done about 12 or 13 interviews. I'm exhausted, but I couldn't be happier about the doors that I opened today. Pleasure meeting you. I'll be in touch. <laughs> All right, great to meet you. Thank you very much. Oh, I really appreciate it. You know, now in hindsight, it's it was all worth it. You know, all the preparation. This is all what we come to the J School for. To finally have this moment, it's a great experience. I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes after the day. As you can see, there was a lot of energy in that room. And if you join our class of 2016, you and your classmates will have your very own expo uh, exactly one year from, from now. That said, our department is career services. We're not career placement. We don't place students in jobs. A Columbia J School degree alone doesn't get you a job, and there's no promise of a, of a job after, after graduation in journalism. We will do our very best to help you open doors. Uh, we do that for all of our students. We work very, very hard at that. But ultimately, it will be your job to knock down the door and land in the newsroom. What we can promise is that we will help you to understand the job market, where you fit, give you the tools to compete, and as you can see, you'll be face to face with tons of recruiters, employers at the, at the expo. We can also promise you that you will have the cutting edge skills and training to hit the ground running and to be very desirable to the employers that, that you meet. In a J school degree, we feel very strongly that you're investing not in a short term job, but in a lifetime of a profession and a career. When it comes to employment after you leave journalism school, Columbia Journalism School, the best predictor that we can point to is the track record of our graduates. And these are the facts. For the class of 2014, we do a survey just a few weeks before graduation. 75% of our students reported that they had plans. That means they were reporting that they had landed internships, fellowships, had full-time job, full jobs lined up. Uh, or part-time employment, including freelance gigs, and that's real freelance gigs, not, not just the, um, the hope of being a freelancer. They were continuing in academics or returning to their full-time job, previous job. Uh, that's just the beginning of the, of the cycle. Every week over the summer and into the fall, more students land positions, uh, internships convert to jobs, and grads get new gigs altogether. So where do 
our grads land. Um, that's what you're seeing uh, behind me, where our grads have landed in the past several years. Our grads are everywhere, and I have to say it's awesome, and it really helps me in my, in, in my work as well with, with you. Uh, just about every journalism organization you can think of, and these days some of our grads are launching their own companies and hiring their fellow alums. Our track record is consistent. We're not talking just about, you know, we don't, you know, keep this, you know, up just because we had one grad, you know, land at one place five years ago. Um, you can look at it yourself, check it out on LinkedIn, put a company name in, put, uh, you know, Columbia Journalism School, chances are you'll find at least one alum and there's a good uh, shot, there are probably several. It's always really exciting for us to, uh, to, to do that. It's also a really powerful example of what the alumni work, uh, network is going to be like. It's an amazing club and in coming to Columbia, you're uh, investing in a lifetime membership. Uh, as you saw with Anoop, who you know, frequently uh, calls me up and says, hey, there's this job at the Washington Post. What does the job market look f like for this year's class, the 20, class of 2015, and ultimately for your class, 2016? We don't have a crystal ball. Uh, we can't create jobs, and look, if the economy tanks, all bets are, are off. We don't have any statistics for 2015 yet. It's too early, and I'm very, very cautious here, but so far this spring, um, and in the wake of the Career Expo, I, I feel very confident things are, are looking really, really like a good season. Uh, first, there are some opportunities that you can count on every year uh, moving forward. We have dozens of exclusive paid internships at various companies all around the world just for our, our graduates. I'm um, not sure if you have them in your packets or not, but they're behind me and they're on our website as well. Um, in this class, uh, you know, somebody will go to Al Jazeera in Doha. We'll have somebody at ABC News in London, somebody in Washington Bureau. Uh, somebody will go to, a couple people will go to Clarine in Argentina. We have people going to the BBC in Washington. We just launched this year PBS Frontline um, in, in Boston, an exclusive one-year paid postgraduate fellowship. Univision in Miami, Reuters, La Stampa in, in, um, in Milan, Italy. We're very proud of these exclusive opportunities to work um, at these places and we work very hard to grow that list uh, every year. In addition, the J School invests in um, some opportunities for you to continue here and do reporting as postgraduate fellowships, uh, fellows after you graduate. Uh, Dean Cole in the last, uh, last year launched a postgraduate fellowship reporting project on the environment. There are four people that are working with a investigations editor following their graduation. There are four people that are continuing coverage of um, education, teaching the, the teaching of um, the training of teachers in America. We also have people receiving magic grants from the uh, Brown Center on Digital Innovation. Some of them are developing new platforms with these grants and there's you know, real money attached to them. New platforms for storytelling and technologies that may in fact really revolutionize um, how we all transform our daily diet of, of journalism. Uh, it's, a, it's brand new language there um, all the time and that's a very exciting part of, uh, of the journalism school, both the Tau Center and, uh, and Brown. On the full-time job front, it's a little early. We're just beginning to sort of see the results because people generally don't hire a couple of months before you know, they have a, uh, a position to, to fill. Uh, yesterday, a grad came in, into our office. He has just been hired uh, by Univision full-time for a, to uh, cover business and on a brand new digital uh, track that they're, they're opening, a, a new, um, new digital team. He met them for the first time two weeks ago. Another grad uh, met editors from Houstonia Magazine and the Philadelphia City Paper at the Expo and is now deciding between two offers for full-time uh, reporting positions. So now they're coming in. It's very exciting. You know, students will run up, run up the stairs to our office with you know, various opportunities that they're considering. On the internship front, some of those hit a lot earlier this is a, just a quick snapshot of the landings that we know about so far, just a, a small piece of them. 
We have two students heading to BuzzFeed for exclusive summer internships. Those are exclusive to the J School, one on the investigative team and one on the data team. As I mentioned, we have a grad that's going to frontline, actually two grads that are going to frontline for one year exclusive paid reporting fellowships. We have two people, a couple people going to the Miami Herald. We have two internships at the New York Times, one in the business section, one in the interactive team that people have already landed. We dominated the Overseas Press Club Awards against, again this year. We have six people going um, to do uh, grant funded international reporting projects as well as internships. We have several students, a number of students, going to do network internships. Um, you know, it's a long list and, and things are really looking, looking very good. Two, two or three people going to the Christian Science Monitor, uh, uh, two people going to six month staff writing positions. So, you know, these results are, 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 are looking good. Um, in the past week alone, uh, we've had dozens of students doing follow-up interviews with people they met at the expo. They're taking a, a wide variety of meetings. Um, now this, uh, International Business News, Vice HBO, Vice News, The Atavist, Inside Climate News, CNN Money, The Guardian US, Newsday, Popular Mechanics. This is all out of a two-week, um, all in a two-week period. Uh, a new, uh, you've heard a little bit about this, a quick, couple of quick words just for international students. How many international students in the room? Not too many. Um, you do face additional challenges. Um, as you know, when you graduate, you will you know, uh, have access to the OPT, the one year work visa. Uh, that gives you the ability to compete with everybody else in, in the job market. But foreign students will face significant hurdles entering the job market in the US. Fewer than a handful can expect to be sponsored for long-term employment. And you will find that many, um, if not most, of U.S. companies are not willing to take on foreigners, even for the OPT year, because if they don't sponsor, they're not interested in investing in you. However, uh, every year, some of our international students, um, I think the past couple years, we've had an awful a lot of valedictorians or people you know that have gotten which is our measure the Pulitzer traveling grants of the <coughs> top students of the class and they have gotten um, you know plum assignments business and financial news um, or if you have data programming skills computer programming and, and data skills they are certainly um, the most competitive uh, where, where you'll be able to compete most effectively but we do want to be crystal clear for international students it is tough and you shouldn't come to the J school expecting it to be your magic carpet to living here indefinitely or even in the short term past, past graduation okay so for all of you including international students what are your prospects uh, let's let me just get a quick show of hands how many of you have had five uh, well three to five years of, ex of prior experience in journalism how many of you only want to write movie reviews and long-form non-fiction narrative and probably only at the New Yorker? <laughs> Be honest, usually, yeah, if you're really honest, there are more hands, okay, good, good for you. Um, and who has experience in business or medicine or accounting? Okay, so, you know, as you can see, there's an enormous range of experience and interests in this room. And as I said before, there is no one size fits all for the job market or one path in journalism. Uh, when you graduate from the J School, the majority of you will not launch your careers immediately in full-time jobs. It will be in paid internships, fellowships, and some of you will decide to launch careers as uh, freelance journalists. Your salaries are going to range from you know, minimum wage, uh, hourly employment, to staff jobs ranging from you know, 25, 28, 30 to $60,000. Um, annually, if you're a dual degree or computer science student, you can expect an awful lot more. And obviously, if you've had experience, you're going to be competing at a, uh, at a, at a higher level. Some of you are going to decide to stay in New York and only look at this market. It's an incredibly you know, exciting place, but it is you know, uh, as vibrant as it is. It's very crowded, and it's difficult to break into. Um, some of you are going to only hold out for big name outlets, and you may be holding out for a while. We really suggest you get out there, do journalism, win your Pulitzer, and then you know, you'll have a red carpet to the New York Times. Um, the bottom line, as we see it, well, the bottom line is, the more flexible you are to a variety of opportunities, the more opportunities you'll have to consider. If you will 
uh, if you're willing to relocate outside of New York, and that doesn't mean Boston, San Francisco, or Paris on, on your list, if, you, if you'll consider niche B2B publications, outlets off the beaten track, if you don't want to go on air but work as a local news producer, for example, you will be in demand. Uh, there will be jobs out there for you. We strongly encourage you to be open to the world of journalism. There are interesting and important stories to be told, wonderful adventures uh, to be had, uh, prize-winning editors and terrific positions at smaller outlets you've never heard of all across the country and all around the world. Um, if you expand your horizons, we are very confident that you will find rewarding, meaningful, paid work. Um, so that's the view from you know, where I sit in career services. Um, it's a really exciting, you know, fabulous time to be a journalist, and we will do our very help, you know, best to help you break in, succeed, and navigate in this new world. Do we have time? I guess we have time for a couple, couple questions. Um, so I saw La Stampa in Italy was up on the list. If you take an internship there, first of all, is that an English, English language reporting internship or is it an Italian language? It, they really prefer people and you can do that much more work if you, if you speak Italian. So, um, you know, I think that if your Italian is not fluent or near fluent, that you probably wouldn't be a competitive candidate for it. Okay. And then if you take an internship like that, how hard is it to, to sort of like re-enter the job market in the U.S. or in New York and in, in an English speaking? Like, are you as an attractive candidate having worked in Italian as you would be having worked in English as a reporter? Again, no one size fits all. It really depends on, you know, what you've done before you've gone to Italy. Um, you know, in that particular position, depends on the kind of work that you do in Italy. But sure, if you're doing, you'll do terrific work there. You can translate your material. You will have met with a lot of employers at the expo before you go. You'll keep in touch with those employers. So I don't think that should be anything but a, um, you know, a, a positive um, and really exciting. Um, we had one woman who, knew a lot about wine and so she covered a lot of food um, issues in Italy. I mean, that was my fantasy. I wanted to go. Um, oh. Um, what sort of resources are available for alumni, you know, post fellowship Lifetime or membership. Um, you know, we really focus on you um, throughout the year, on, on, on the current class, but, you know, I've probably gotten... 15 queries from alums in the, in the, in the past couple of weeks. Um, we, we're generally not, we never turn anybody away, you know, as an alum, but we're really not generally able to meet one-on-one -on -one for appointments during the year. We set aside a couple of days during the summer. But really most important is that, you know, we give you the training and then we put a lot of resources online that you also always have access to. And the alumni network is, you know, also something that you will be able to call upon. So um, you'll, you'll be in good shape to continue to navigate that way as an alum. Thank you. <clears throat> um, what kind of resources are there for uh, reaching out to smaller markets and finding, like, broadcast producing jobs, for example? Um, because I noticed the list of uh, companies hiring at the job fair are more national and international uh, news outlets. We have a lot more smaller, you, you mentioned broadcast outlets coming than we have students to satisfy them. So for example, this year in terms of broadcast, we had, um, these are station groups that you know, generally have um, you know, between 30, 60, 90 outlets across the country. Uh, we had Nexstar Broadcasting, Quincy Broadcasting in the Midwest that uh, hired three people out of our career, straight out of the Career Expo last year. Media General has stations all across the country. Hearst came. Um, they have, I think, 30, you know, kind of gold, gold star uh, stations across the country. Um, so that, you know, there were, in terms of the representation of small local markets across the country, there were hundreds in the room two weeks ago. So that's, there's definitely a lot going on there. And the same with, um, with newspapers and, and magazines. Look, you know, a lot of these newsrooms are small. They can't necessarily uh, afford to come, but we do have very good uh, contacts with lots of smaller places. We have somebody going to the Colorado um, Springs Gazette. We have somebody going to the Ellsworth American, um, you know, already this, uh, this year. 
uh, you know, Philadelphia City Paper, Calkins Media was here. They have broadcast and and um, and print outlets. So you know, we really we think you should get out there, and we will do everything we can to uh, to help you, uh, rather than just hanging on to the big names where you're going to be making a lot more more coffee in the, in the beginning. We want you to get out there and do what you've been trained to do right from the get go. Thank you. Oh, thank you for being so frank with us. Um, first question, for the 75% um, employment statistic, is that across the board between MS, MA students, people with dual degrees? Um, could you break it down further? I don't have the statistics handy. Uh, between the two degree programs of you know, MS and MA, they're pretty close. I think it's fair to say, which dual degree program are you speaking about? I mean, are you speaking about one in particular that you're thinking about, like SIPA or, you know, CompSci here? Um, I'm not in any, but I imagine that because they have, like, two areas of expertise. Right. It, their statistics might be the, different. The CompSci folks, wish we had more of them. That, that, that makes my job extremely uh, e e easy because people are really com coming after them. But in terms of the other degrees, and we've seen that it's consistent. You know, we were sort of thinking, okay, well, you know, if we looked at the statistics for the past year or so that oh, the people in newspapers wouldn't be doing so well and that the digital people would, you know, bring our stats up, it's quite consistent all across the boards no matter what your focus is um, or, your, or your degree program. They're, they're similar. But if you add a second degree, particularly if it's in data, you know, computational science, um, you know, you, that would certainly uh, skew our odds. But we, they can't skew our odds yet because they're relatively small programs. What, I think we have like six graduates a, a year. And it's weighted. Okay. okay. Um, let's follow up. Sure. Can you explicitly say what the 25 percent are up to? <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully, since that was from 2014, you know, there may be a new 20, you know, 5% that's cycling through, but, you know, hopefully that 25% is employed. The reason that we don't have um, good statistics about that is that you all drop off the map pretty quickly. It's a little easier for us now with social media, but whenever we do six month or a year follow up surveys, we don't get very good compliance. And, um, you know, we don't have the time at the moment to go through 300 LinkedIn profiles. They're not always, um, you know, up to date. People are moving from from one place to another, but you know, pe people are working. Not not easy, but people are definitely, definitely, definitely working. And again, as I said, um, you know, that 75 percent is just the beginning. People are going to cycle through. A three-month internship will end. They'll get a full-time job someplace, or they won't, and they'll go someplace else. And I'll hear from them, and my colleagues will hear from them, and we'll help you know them, you know, relaunch and uh, and and land. But it can take a while. Hi. Um, Speaking of moving from one place to another, do you have any statistics on what percent of students or graduates uh, stay within New York City the first year out and what percent move somewhere else? That's a good question, and we've never looked at it that way, and maybe we will, you know, we certainly could based on our, our graduation survey. But again, you know, just because somebody stays in New York, you know, for the first three months doesn't mean that they stay, you know, for the year after. So that, you know, they're very squishy. It's tough for us to get a, a handle on. But we, we could certainly run the number in terms of percentage um, that's, that stay in, in New York. That, you know, that's obviously the hope and dream of a lot of people. But, you know, what we hope is that you practice journalism and then if you want to come back, you will. Uh, what about teaching jobs or assistant teaching jobs, like for instance, I'm in the documentary program, would love to continue making documentaries and teach on the side. It, are there resources? For yes, that? we have resources on our website. We do hear about, about teaching jobs, but you know, if you look around, um, there are many programs, for example, that require a PhD. Other programs that are more vocational, you know, want people with, um, you know, with the J school terminal degree. Tough way to make a living. I mean, I think it's a good thing to think about how you're going to support your documentary habit. Um, you know, hopefully you'll do it with your own films, but you know, a lot of people have other um, jobs that sustain their their filmmaking. But teaching is a is an, it's, a, it's a great complement, but not necessarily what's going to help you to, uh, to make films. Right. Okay. But we have a lot of resources and people come to us for positions like that, but relatively small universe. Dean Souders, do you have a question? Or are you gonna cut me off? I'm the last person. Okay. 
Oh, no, there's one other, Hi. one other, okay, okay. Hi, uh, uh, thank you for speaking to us. It was very reassuring to know, to have that kind of support. Um, you showed a lot of data about recent graduates uh, in terms of internships and jobs. I was wondering if you have, if you know what percentage is MA and what percentage MS out of those, like, Again, I'd have to look at these statistics, but they're quite, um, they're quite similar based on our graduation survey that, um, you know, about 75% of MAs and 75% of the, of the MS students are, are landing. So in that respect, you know, at that moment in time, which is really the way that we get um, <laughs> compliance in that survey is that in order to get your graduation tickets, you need to fill out the survey. And that's why we have uh, a good, good data um, that, that we can, uh, can rely on there. But it's consistent between the two programs. So it's not like one overshadows the other? No, it's not. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I will be available uh, after, after lunch, and I look forward to, uh, to meeting you and hopefully to working with you next year. Thank you, Dean Hartenstein. We'll pretend this is a Yankees game, and we'll have a seventh inning uh, stretch here. We're not going to play any organ music, however. But uh, while we get our next group up here set up, why don't you all stand up, stretch, introduce yourselves to the person next door if you haven't uh, done so already. And uh, just plan to be back in your seats in just a couple minutes, OK? Thank you very much. Great. 
perfect. No problem. Okay. Oh, I love I love it. Well played. Oh. No. I have. Well, I, had, I do have to talk to her about one thing. I just. Are these things off? Okay, we're going to get started again. If you'd like to take your seats. I know this is, a, this is a long morning and you guys have been a fabulous audience. Very glad to see you all again. I know that many of you were out late last night. Um, I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Before I introduce our um, guest panel of alums, I want to take a minute to introduce um, some of the admissions staff who are here in the room, um, people who I know that you have been corresponding with, talking with, meeting with, um, but just so that you know who they are, and also to let you know that we will be in our offices between 1 and 3 this afternoon for those of you who have individual questions. Um, but first of all, I would like to introduce David Hooker. David, if you would stand, please. I know David has spoken probably with almost all of you. Um, David is our administrative assistant, and he does everything, knows everybody, and will help you with anything that you need help with. So, David, thank you. Then in the back, Brett Sion. Brett, if you would just wave your arm. Brett has organized all of this. Um, I would like to give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. And Brett has organized this with the help of another staff member, Diane Nguyen, who is, um, I think, down at the other end organizing the um, things that will be in the world room this, uh, this afternoon. And then I'd like to introduce also Taryn Almanzar. Taryn in the pink um, and gray. Taryn is our director of financial aid and admissions. She and Edwin Isaac will be doing another session starting at about noon on financial aid, scholarships, um, and how to do your budget planning for this. Um, but I want to thank all of them. Also our student assistant, Rana, who many of you I think met at the reception desk downstairs. Um, and just to thank you all for doing an absolutely wonderful job on this. Next, I would like then to introduce our alumni guests who are here this morning. Um, and actually, I'm going to have them introduce themselves. They're going to talk with you um, about a number of things, about their, what they're doing now, about their experiences before they came to the journalism, what they learned here. Um, and they will also then take questions. So, Casey, you want to oh, start? Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Casey Finey. I uh, graduated from the uh, J School in 2013. And before I came to the J School, I was working for some random video company and freelancing for uh, two websites. And so, just like it, just in the point of my career, I was ready to kind of transition into grad school. And so uh, the program I chose, I did the Master of Arts, the MA in Arts and Culture. And because uh, I had prior experience and I just wanted to specialize in something. And so did the J School. And then day after I graduated from the program, I started working for Good Morning America uh, as a social media producer. And I got sick of waking up at four in the morning, every morning, so I worked there for a year. And then I uh, started working for Fast Company. Uh, and now I'm their sort of cultural reporter. So that's just kind of like a timeline of my events. But uh, my experience at the J School was really incredible because I had an opportunity to, uh, I already had kind of like the skill set uh, of like reporting and writing, but it was really, the, the MA program was really great because I had an opportunity to specialize in something. And so when you do the MA program, you have a choice between arts and culture, politics, science, and business. And it's a, just a really intensive seminar program like where you are uh, doing, you're not doing so much reporting and writing, you're just really learning uh, the, the, the sort of craft of your field and really learning how to shape those skills that you have. And 
just from the class assignments to the, the thesis, uh, the thesis that we had to do, the 10,000 word article that you have to write. Um, it was just a really great experience because I, I already knew how to write, but now I, I learned how to become like a better writer and a better reporter uh, with the program. So, and you have just an infinite amount of resources. I had the best seminar professors and yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a really incredible experience. So that's just kind of my, my rundown. Do you want to describe what your master's thesis was about? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I did uh, the lack of racial diversity among women in classical ballet. I am not a dancer. Uh, I just wanted a challenge. I, I wanted to do something about uh, either about like racial inequality or, you know, uh, just something along those lines. And I figured, oh, you know, I'm doing the arts and culture program. Like, let me write about something that I never written about before. So I chose ballet and it was a really fantastic uh, experience. I got to travel to uh, uh, DC, San Francisco and Chicago uh, reporting. And yeah, it was a really, it was really, it was really fantastic. And I'm still trying to decide what I want to do with it because you're highly encouraged to publish your thesis or do something with it, but I still haven't figured out what I want to do with it. But uh, it's sitting on my computer, 11,000 words, um, <laughs> just trying to figure out what to do with it. But yeah, it was a really, really incredible experience just having that, re reporting on something at that length because I had never written something at that length before. So, yeah, it's intense. Very intense. Yeah. Monica? Sure. Hi, my name is Monica Alba, and I graduated in 2012. I actually did the documentary program with Ben Teitelbaum, who you'll hear from in a moment. So we did the sort of added semester, and we actually took the summer, uh, but you don't technically graduate until a little bit later. But 2012 was our graduation year. So like Casey, I had a bit of journalism experience before I came to Columbia. I had worked at documentary production companies and media research centers and kind of bounced around trying to figure out what I wanted to do next and then applied to Columbia. So since then, I have worked at NBC News. I went to do a program straight out of Columbia that's for students who are either in undergrad or grad programs called the News Associates Program, which is a terrific rotational program that allows you to work at the different platforms at NBC News. So I worked in their DC bureau, I worked for Nightly News, I worked at uh, the long form show and a mix of things. And then ultimately landed with their investigative unit. So I've been in the investigative unit at NBC for the last year and a half, working on everything from sort of breaking news reactions to far longer sort of six month investigation. So, which was something that Columbia really prepared me for because in the documentary program, Ben and I actually were filmmaking partners, and so we got to work on a film and sort of just immerse ourselves in it for months at a time, and then ultimately end up with a 40-minute product. So, um, I my I think the most important experience I had at the at the J School was that documentary program. But in addition to that, the sort of investigative skills course that I took and the video storytelling class that we took with Betsy West and Lisa Cohen, which is absolutely terrific, um, were some of my favorite experiences, but I am at a network now, and so it is, I know it's really difficult, and a lot of people think, like, how, how can you get a job in New York after going to J school, but it is, it is possible, and Columbia was instrumental in that. Monica, I know that there are people in the audience who are not in the Stabile Investigative Journalism program, but who are interested in doing investigative work. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about the investigative course that you took. Sure, so I actually, um, yeah, I wasn't in Stabile exactly, and, but I still had a really good opportunity to take courses. So I did a skills class with Charlie Ornstein, who um, is with ProPublica, I think now, or was, um, and is an amazing healthcare reporter. And the beauty of the skills course is that it's really a sort of boot camp and everything you need to know, but those things are the exact things I needed in order to get my job, ultimately, with the investigative unit everything from filing you know, Freedom of Information Act to knowing how to find different government documents to understanding sort of how different government agencies work and what's public and what's not. Um, and that we definitely did. And then there was also a really, really intense focus on sort of finding out certain information about different companies. So whether it's you know, using GuideStar or Charity Navigator for a 501c3 or using you know, FEC filing reports and things like that. Um, so it was, it was great in terms of just getting 
a really basic understanding, and then I actually was able to apply those things um, to other sort of stories I was working on. And uh, our documentary wasn't investigative, really, in any in any sense. Um, but so, but I got I had definite investigative skills that then translated to work. So you definitely have an opportunity. Um, and then I know I didn't take um, the longer investigative course I wish I had, which is terrific. Uh, which it, does Walt still teach that class here? Um, Bogdanish, right? Yeah. So uh, that's a terrific class and opportunity too for somebody who's interested in investigations. Thank you, Ben. Uh, my name is Ben Teitelbaum, and I'm currently a producer at HuffPost Live, the video streaming network of the Huffington Post. And before journalism school, I had no professional journalism experience. I wrote a basketball blog on my own, like all millennials did when the internet became a thing. And I was traveling and teaching, and I sort of always thought I would want to do something in journalism, but didn't know how I wanted to go about it or where I wanted to apply things. And I was actually inspired to go to school by ESPN's dive into uh, more long form sports and society work. So E60, the, the 30 for 30 films. And I had absolutely no background at all in anything video or photo. I had never picked up anything other than a point and shoot camera, no editing software. But I thought these are cool skills. The world's changing. I, I want to learn this. And I don't know a better way of learning it than going to school. So. Things worked out, uh, and I applied, got in to the broadcast uh, MS, also the documentary program. And it was really transformative for me, because I had no idea whether I would be able to do the, the manual things. And if any of you out there are a little bit nervous about the skills portion of the things, the instructors and the teachers are really, really good. And the one-on-one -on -one instruction is absolutely fantastic. I had some reservations about whether I'd be able to use a camera, line it up, edit, but trust me, they will, we all have the ability to do it, and Columbia is the place to be able to practice, to be able to make mistakes, to have the one-on-one -on -one help to do that. So just the skills training, the practical uh, work here was super uh, instrumental. Uh, at the same time, I was able to keep writing, which is what I had done before. So I love that Columbia does provide you with a balance where you can explore new things, you can do the digital, you can do uh, the broadcast and, and, and radio if you want, uh, digital media, but stay uh, with, if you've been a writer before, writing and, and get better at that. After school, uh, I, I lucked into my first gig. It's, it's funny because one of the best things about Columbia Journalism School is the network you develop and the friends you develop and everything on my career path has been due to a strong bond I formed here. Uh, it turned out that Monica's boyfriend, who she met at the journalism school, who was a good friend of mine before they were together, graduated <laughs> four months before we did, because we did the extra uh, semester for uh, documentary. And he was at the Daily Beast in the video department, and they had a part-time gig. And I was working on finishing our film, because we wanted to make it longer. We launched a Kickstarter. Our film ended up going to a bunch of film festivals, and now we're working on distribution, so that was pretty cool. Uh, but I was looking for something to tide me over and you know, pay the rent while I worked on that. And Jake said, come on in, work some weekends, work a little bit during the week. And the freelance turned into permalance, which turned into a full-time job. And uh, I was at the Daily Beast for about a year and a half doing a wide range of video things. And just when I was feeling like I was hitting my plateau and wanted to look outside, it turned out that another classmate of mine from journalism school here called me up and said, send me a resume. There might be an opening at HuffPost Live. And three weeks later, I had a job offer. And now I've been there for about nine months. And uh, day to day, I'm responsible for half an hour to an hour of content. It's a lot. And uh, it sometimes can be a grind, but I love it because I'm working on absolutely every uh, subject matter. So in one week, I'll do some hard news stories about, I don't know, ISIS or politics, and then uh, a show where we bring in live animals on set, and, and then another one where we do a, a broad look at uh, maybe some, some cultural influences that are happening in America. So I, I personally really like being able to work in a bunch of different uh, topic matters, and yeah, Columbia prepared me for that, because while I was here, I worked on stories that were hard news, and I worked on stories that were lighter, and, and I was able to learn to write for print and for broadcast uh, in, in all those subjects. So 
Yeah, highly recommend. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, I would like to, because you guys are such a great audience, I've forewarned um, our guests here that you have a lot of questions. So I'd like to open things up for questions. Now you can't let me down after I've said that. <laughs> Anybody has any questions? What was your documentary about? Go ahead, Ben. Our documentary was a sports film about a group of guys from over 20 different countries who found an unlikely community in New York through the unlikely sport of team handball. Um, outside of documentary and I guess whatever your main focus was, what was the most helpful and useful class that you took here? Oh, um, I would have to say, uh, I, really, I really enjoyed our seminar because in the MA program, you know, you, you, have, you have your required classes, but you can also, you can also take uh, electives. And, but I really do think like the most, the, the most helpful uh, class that I took was our seminar class because that's really like where you just sit for two hours, you know, and in our case, just talking about arts and culture. So that's kind of my thing. And it, it, was, it was really, you're just in a room with uh, your fellow students just discussing uh, these pieces that you read and they bring in, uh, they, they, we have writers from the New Yorker come in and talk about how they do long form. And, you know, so it was a really kind of like nice uh, little think tank is your seminar class. So I would say the seminar is like my favorite class. I think video storytelling, which is the class I mentioned, because it was a terrific workshop of three stories, and they were, you know, slightly long form for someone like me who works in network news. To have a piece that's five to seven minutes is like an eternity. But those are the kinds of pieces that we got to do in this course. And so you would basically uh, have a partner, and you would turn in sort of a, a rough cut, and then get so much feedback and so many notes about what to do better and what to improve, and then go back and submit another cut. And then it, so in terms of workshopping and understanding the specifics, that's exactly what I do in my job now. We submit a script, we work, we submit a rough cut, and then your you know, senior ed editors give you notes, and then you go forth. So it was a perfect example of sort of the pro the process of workshopping stories um, and then also just having a little bit more time to spend on stories and, and the reporting, which I think was great. I also took video storytelling and it was fantastic. All the classes were really awesome and balanced each other out. I really enjoyed uh, sports reporting with Sandy Padway and he's like the coolest guy. Uh, but one thing we got to do in that class, which we didn't always in, in some of the other classes, was just sit and talk about journalism. So a lot of classes here, you're, you're producing, you're workshopping, you're, you're working on, on reporting, but we would have uh, an hour straight in class every class where we would just sit and talk about the challenges, the struggles, the ethics, how to craft sentences, the big picture, the small picture, and, and some of that taking time just to parse it out with someone who's so knowledgeable, uh, like our professor was, uh, totally invaluable. Okay, since I'm keeping my eye on the clock here, I'm just going to say that the people who are standing at the mics um, are going to be the last people to ask questions, and I'll ask you to keep uh, your questions to just one, and um, I'll ask you guys just for one of you to answer sure. the question. So why don't you start? Um, this is uh, specifically for uh, Monica. You Can you speak the, directly into the microphone? Um, this is about the News Associate Program that you mentioned. Can you go into detail about that? Sure. I think now actually all the networks offer it, which is great. And it's a one-year program where the, the different networks handle it a little bit differently. But at NBC, it's a one-year program where they have you rotate. And ideally, you do four rotations. And if you have a good match at one of these places, you are ideally offered a staff job. So it's a one-year position with no promise of a job at the end of it. But the hope is that you find a good team. And so it's everything from the digital platforms to the television platforms to the bureaus. And I think CBS and ABC do it a little bit differently so if you're at a in a rotation that you're happy with you can sort of elongate it mm -hmm. I think if and then hope in the hopes again that a staff position opens up 
but it's a great way of sort of seeing what, if you're someone that you know you want to work in broadcast, but you're not sure whether you want to be on, you know, an evening news program or in the morning show, or whether you want to do digital, uh, it's a great way of finding out. So talk to your career advisors about it, um, but it was an, I, I have a good, great program. I really recommend looking into it. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so you all mentioned sort of getting like a wide range of skills developing these during your time here. What was your approach to selecting courses that would hone these skills while still maintaining focus in your studies? That's, that's a good question. That's a tough question. Well, I really wanted to focus on the video aspect of things, so I made sure to take classes that were video focused, but they're within skill sets, classes with different focus. So video, for example, there's nightly news where you're working on a news program, turning around things really quickly, part of that grind. Video storytelling, you take more time to workshop things, do uh, stuff maybe more like 60 minutes. Then there's, uh, there are other classes using different types of cameras, even more long form than that. Um, so uh, within the, the video skills classes, uh, th there are tons of options. I didn't know that I wanted to go into the grind of nightly news. I thought I always wanted to do something a little more long form. That's why I did video storytelling. And then classes around it, basically, I just picked things that I was interested in. And there was, there was so much, so, you know, sports reporting and a couple others. But uh, for me, it was what am I interested in outside of this one main focus, which I hit pretty hard. Hey guys, so I was wondering, do you, did you feel like the career fair differed for you as documentary students from the regular MS students at all? Not really. I mean, we, I definitely made the connections that were ultimately um, where I had my options at the career fair. What was nice about documentary was that I knew that I would be done by September and so I, could, I just had to tell sort of employers up front this is my constraint, and luckily all the News Associates programs don't start until the fall anyway, so that worked out really well for me. But I think if, you, if you're upfront about it, you know, it's great to just make the connection, and if they say, well, there's nothing right now, you can definitely get back to them. But it wasn't, I don't know if you have anything else, but I think it was, it was great. The career fair was terrific. Awesome, thank you. Hi, my question's for Casey. Um, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, I know that the MA network is, or the MA cohort is a little bit smaller, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you found, if you found your network to be as expansive and strong after graduation, and what some other MA classmates are, are up to now. Right. Oh, no, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I actually really liked the fact that it was, uh, that it was a smaller network, um, because it would just gave you a better opportunity to kind of uh, just n network with like a closer knit and closer uh, group of people. And it, what's great about the MA program is the fact that these are journalists who've had uh, experience before. And so you are really, you know, mixing with people who have just a wealth of knowledge. I mean, there's a guy who's working uh, for the Wall Street Journal. And he actually went back. He's like reporting uh, from Singapore for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there's a guy in my arts and culture seminar who he was nominated for, uh, he's up for, um, uh, an ASME award for his thesis. And so like, and he, he got it published in like, you know, uh, This American Life and all these other forms. So, you know, it's, it's, it was a really, really incredible group of people. And, you know, not to take anything away from the MS students at all, um, but the MA is just really nice because you just have these people who are there who've had, you know, just kind of like a world of experience and you're all there to kind of like concentrate on something. And um, yeah, I'm, and you, you, you still hold on to that network because I'm still very close with like a lot of the people who are in my seminar because you're trapped in a room for two hours. So you're bound to get close with people. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really great network. Uh, this question isn't for anyone in particular, whoever would like to answer it, but um, how do you think your career would be different if you hadn't gone through this program? Casey, okay. <laughs> take it if you want it. <laughs> well, I would say that, um, man, I, I feel like it, I, I, was, I, was, I was fine in my career until I, it, before I came to uh, Columbia, I was doing okay, but like whenever I got to Columbia, it was 
not only just the, the skills that I learned to kind of like add on to what I already knew, but it was honestly, um, the Career Expo was an amazing experience because I walked away with four job offers. Um, and it, these are these are things that I don't think I would have been able to get without the Career Expo because you know these employers are coming to Columbia because they know the kind of students that are admitted here, and so you know of course you have you know your your skills and your talents play into it, but also you know having the name of Columbia goes a long long way because like whenever I met with uh, with ABC like my first job at Good Morning America. The guy was like, "Oh yeah, no, I, I was at Columbia too. I was, yeah, I was an MS student. And, you know, that really kind of was. I was, like I said, started the day after graduation, and you know, even though it was an insane job, you know, I walked away with an Emmy. So there's that. Um, yeah, thank you. I know it was. Yeah." <laughs> but yeah, so I, I so don't go for think, the Emmy is what you're saying. Yeah, go for go for go for the gold. Um, so I, I don't think any of that would have been possible had I not come to Columbia because I feel like you know my career is kind of going at a decent pace, but Columbia just definitely kind of like ratcheted up to like you know the next degree. It was great. So <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Um, this is probably more for Ben or Monica, but for uh, those who are interested in more long form uh, video versus, I'm thinking, you know, 30 minutes or more, um, would you say that after graduation it would be more realistic to turn to freelance for this kind of form and then, you know, possibly find other types of jobs or are there opportunities um, for that? Well, so we have a few friends. Neither of us ended up going into full time. Uh, the documentary space, but we do have friends who have su successfully done that. One of our close classmates is working for a small production company that does this long form. We have another friend who, uh, after graduation, went off and freelanced and made his own film, which was picked up by Al Jazeera. So it's not as wide a uh, field as far as available jobs, especially in, in New York and, and the journalism market, but it definitely is emerging, and I think a lot of traditional journalism places see the value, I don't know if you agree, Monica, in long form, and I know, uh, for example, at HuffPost, we just launched a documentary uh, unit. We haven't produced anything yet, but they announced it last week, and so they're starting to build that team out. And I know there are a lot of places that are going in that direction. So uh, I feel like it's a field that's only expanding a lot of traditional print places that went online are now going to want to be, you know, a lot of them are saying 50% video in the next couple of years, and documentary is obviously an important part of that. So I think it's something evolving, and there definitely is the space to be hired at small production companies. There definitely is the opportunity, if you have a good idea and, and some metal, to do it on your own and get it picked up. There are countless stories of J-schoolers who've produced a film that then went on to play film festivals, get picked up, win awards, et cetera. So I don't know if there's a clear path, but it, there are definitely a lot of possibilities. Um, did you consider other schools and other journalism programs, and how did you decide on Columbia? And also, as you enter the job market, do you feel like you have a leg up in the world, in the journalism world, having gone to Columbia, and when you encounter graduates of other programs, do you say, oh, I mean, how do you feel like you compare? I didn't apply anywhere else. I don't know about you guys. I didn't apply anywhere else. I applied to six schools. <laughs> <laughs> I've always had a tough time making decisions in life. Like, I'm terrible at a menu. Don't go to dinner with me if you want to do things quickly. Um, I got into five of them. They were all pretty good options. And at the end, I was strongly considering Northwestern and NYU. NYU because they gave me a ton of money and that's what NYU does, which is valuable because, you know, I didn't have a ton of money. And when it came down to it, uh, there were a couple factors between Northwestern and Columbia. I wanted to be back in New York. It's where the action was. I actually came here undergrad, so I had a little personal motivation. I wanted to return to New York because I left right afterwards. Uh, so that sort of helped make that decision. And, and New York is, is where things happen, you know the Career Expo, the job offers, it's the media center of the world, and it's 
it's not lip service when people say being here for school opens up those avenues. For publishing stuff while you're in school, to randomly making connections, you'll be walking through your beat in school with a camera on and someone will talk to you, what are you shooting? Oh, I'm in journalism school. Let me give you your card maybe when you're out. That actually happened to me when I was in East Harlem here shooting a, a story on participatory budgeting. And NYU versus Columbia, it came down to the, the reputation and I think it is, it's true. I don't want to besmirch NYU. It's a fine program and there are a lot of smart people who have come from it, but Columbia, the name does matter and I've seen that in my career since. You know, there are a lot of Columbia grads in a lot of places and there is this feeling of community. So I, I, it's a great program on its own and then, you know, for, for what it affords you, that's why I came here. And would you get Sorry if I'm allowed to follow up. Yeah. You, you talked about having sort of landed two jobs through your classmates and very recent graduates. Would you say that the network of, your, your network of classmates and, and recent graduates is almost stronger and has been more instrumental in terms of helping you land jobs than the, the more distant, broad Columbia community? For me personally, yes. Other people have found different experiences because the career services staff here is really good at connecting you with people of different ages and so I think some people that older network has been very key for me it just happened that my classmates were in the right spots at the right time thank you um, based on your experiences what pitfalls would you advise incoming students or your younger selves to avoid and what would you do differently if you could <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Are you going to take that, Casey? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, pitfalls, I would say, or just, oh man. You, I think, the, I think the big thing to just keep in mind is that it is an extremely intense program. Uh, it's very short, and it's because it's so short, it is very intense. And you know, I think that I, I basically like sequestered myself on campus for like the entire year I was here. And um, it, I guess the, the only pitfall, like, I guess the, the one thing to keep in mind is just to really, you have to really be on top of everything. And I think the, I guess if I were to give myself advice, it would be even though it is so busy to make myself more available to uh, the different lectures that they had because like you, they, they bring, like Columbia brings some really, really incredible people to speak like constantly. And I was always like, I have to finish this reading. I have to finish this assignment that I never made myself like available to like, you know, the many, many amazing things that Columbia has to offer. So I think that that's what I would tell my past self is just to like really try to carve out that time to like make make it to these incredible events that Columbia has all the time. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of like my one regret, I guess, was that I just never made enough time to, you know, see like Bob, Bob Woodruff speak and all this other stuff. And it was like really, yeah, damn it. Monica? <laughs> Could I have for one piece <laughs> of gonna, advice? I'm gonna ask each of them to answer this oh, question. Sure. Yeah, I, I echo that. I mean, I, I feel like at times I was stretched too thin, and so then you feel like you're kind of not doing as well or giving 100% to your classes or to... I, I did an internship second semester, which was advised against, I think. Um, and I thought, hey, and it was through someone I met at a Columbia event who was just starting up sort of a new project within NBC, actually. So at the time, I thought, this is great, but it was absolutely a terrible idea for my schedule. There really is no time to intern while you're in a 10-month program. Um, but I sort of tried to squeeze it in. And uh, looking back now, I'm very lucky because I met people there that then were instrumental in helping me get my job at NBC later. But it was too much. And so I think I, I, I kind of wish I had focused a little bit more on some of the things Columbia had to offer and the classes themselves and instead of being like, oh my God, I'm so worried, I need to get an internship, I need to make connections and do all that. So I would really say focus on the school while you're in the school part because all of that will come. And those same people I, put have, I would have probably been able to meet at the career fair or I could have reached out to later on and it would have been totally okay. So 
I think that's, that's the biggest thing I felt that in the second semester I really was, was stretched very thin and so you want to make sure that for the, for the good time you're spending in this building um, and out of it reporting that you are 100% focused on that, I think. Yeah, I wanted to echo Monica because that's exactly what I wanted to say was, yeah, we all come eventually to get a job and help our career or launch our career, but if you're solely focused on the career, you miss out on so much. And it's easy to lose perspective because it is, you know, concerning and we're spending a lot of money here and we need to make that money back and I, I know it's weighing, it, it might weigh on your minds, I know it did on mine, but just, yeah, to echo Monica, that will fall into place and don't be so focused on the career that you don't give the time you need to the moment. And, and I think if you devote yourself to becoming a better journalist, a more resourceful person, a more skilled person while in school, that will have a better uh, impact on your future career resources than just trying to network or just trying to meet people or, or prove to people that you're right for the next job. So that in inherent growth will end up having more of a positive, long-lasting effect. Thank you all very much. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask um, our next, next group to come up. Um, we're going to have um, some current students who are going to be showing you a little bit of the work that they've been doing. Casey, Monica, Ben, thank you again. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. This will be our final session of the formal session of the morning before we venture on to a couple other things. But uh, my name is Brett Sion. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions um, and Financial Aid. And you've heard a lot over the last <laughs> day or so about the types of things that students here do and the types of things that they work on. So we've invited a few current students here to showcase some of the very interesting projects that they're doing. Um, so what I'll just do quickly here is just ask them to go down the line, um, just introduce themselves, the program that they're in, and give a two-minute description of what they're going to be showing the project that they're currently working on. So we'll just go right down the line. All right. Hi. Um, my name is Elena Buffetta. I am in the MS program. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's it. 
And uh, so what am I going to show you? I did this piece for the New York Times. It's actually a finished piece. It was uh, published in the time. Uh, it was a multimedia piece that I did with a, a colleague at uh, Columbia. It's about a U.S. Marine who went back to Iraqi Kurdistan to fight against ISIS along with the, uh, along with the Kurdish Peshmerga. So pretty much what we, uh, what we did is uh, we were in contact with him while he was in Iraq, and we asked him to get a bunch of uh, GoPro footage. And when he came back, he was supposed to go back to Texas to his um, you know, home. Uh, and uh, we asked him to come to New York and meet with us. And uh, we did a, a rough cut and uh, a first draft. It was a multimedia piece, so we had to you know, make sure that uh, you know, the two pieces were inter intertwined without boring the audience. And we sent it to the Times, and they really liked it and um, took it. And so after that, I flew with the Times to Texas uh, to film a little bit more, you know, to do some additional reporting. Uh, got all the footage together, and then edited it uh, along with New York Times editors. And uh, it was published on where was it published? It was published on the home page, the U.S. page, U.S. and politics, and the latest videos page. Um, so yeah, the project is pretty much finished. But that was my uh, first and only freelance piece that I did this year. Uh, while I come, yeah. So we'll show you that one first, but before we do, I'll just have the others very quickly just introduce themselves and what we will be seeing in a couple minutes. Sure. So my name is Lou Mariller. I am an international student. I'm from France. Um, I am in the MS program. The piece that we will show you is part of our class that's called Digital <coughs> Multimedia Workshop. It's taught by Julian Tu, and he is, it's mostly a documentary class. So. It's like a work in progress of the documentary we're producing right now. It is about a rehab center in New Jersey that is made for pregnant women and women reuniting with their children. So, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, I'm Chloe Marmalock. Um, I'm from the UK, also in the MS program. Um, me and Lou are making the documentary together. So, yeah, you'll see it in a second. Hi, uh, I'm Shelby Hartman. I'm in the MA Arts and Culture program, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about my master's thesis, which is a 10,000 word story on the musical street culture in New Orleans post Katrina. And I have some um, audio, some music files of the musicians that I'm profiling, and some photos that go along with the story. So we'll start with the Lanus here, and I will press play, and you can take a look. I think it'd be hard for us to find a conflict anytime soon that's so black and white, easy to pick a side. And yeah, I did. I did hope for something like that. I did hope that there would be a chance to uh, split some heads. Yeah. You know, I have no quarrels with the religion of Islam. Um, my problem with ISIS is they're a, uh, they're not people. You know, the things they're doing are horrible. My name is Patrick Maxwell. In December, I traveled to uh, Suleimania, Kurdistan, to join the Kurdish Peshmerga and fight against ISIS. This is another round incoming right now. This was very clear. It was a band of marauders who, uh, who rape women and children and sell them into sexual slavery versus a people who have been fighting for their homeland for years. It was also a chance to have a story that no one else could beat, I guess, and have an adventure while I'm doing it. When I'm enlisted, I'm there to serve my country, protect my country, obey the orders of the officers appointed over me. As a private citizen, I'm going to have an adventure, essentially, and that's my own business. I figured it out by just using Google and Facebook, honestly. I talked to some people that uh, put me in contact with a uh, Peshmerga lieutenant. I wore, you know, my old Marine Corps uniform just because it was what I had. My armored plate carrier over that, a set of boots, magazine pouches. Bought a plane ticket from Austin to Suleimani and went. When I touched down, um, I was probably three or four in the morning, so dark, obviously. And it took me to a nearby base, and we stayed there for a while. The Peshmerga fighters, I lived with them for six weeks. You know, they're a good bunch of dudes, kind of mismatched uniforms and weapons, stuff like that. Eat flatbread and rice for, you know, two or three meals a day. It was different, a lot different than staying like a U.S. military base. I was sleeping on the floor of a ship container right next to them, carrying the same AK-47 they carried. What we saw was more of a more of a trench trench warfare type scenario. Just uh, we've got a trench line. They've got a trench line, anywhere from 100 to 1,000 meters away, and everyone's got flags up, and we just watch each other. 
and occasionally shoot at each other. The local reaction to us was good. They're very hospitable, they're very gracious people. They're very excited to have some Westerners there. I had a ball cap, I kept the Texas flag patch on it and it was great because they'd always ask me, you're American, where are you from? I'd show them the flag, it's in Texas, everyone's face lit up. I'd say, oh, George Bush, Texas, because everyone knows George Bush and loves him over there. It's pretty funny. Hello. Talking to the special forces advisors that we met there. They let us know that unofficially it was kind of cool what we were doing, but the official word from the consulate was that, you know, obviously we shouldn't be there, we needed to go home. I think after after our experience, the Peshmerga has pretty much uh, put their foot down and said, we don't want any more Westerners coming over here because, frankly, we'd rather have, uh, you know, weapons and, and training more than, uh, more than Western volunteers. When I look back at it, it was a cool experience. It was still a cool story. If there was a chance to take all the politics out of the situation and I would go straight to the front line with a weapon in my hand and actually take part in stuff on a large scale, then yeah, I'd go back tomorrow. Elena, is there any part of that that you are most proud of or found the most challenging putting together or? Um, well, something that was, um, that was extremely challenging because I've never done, well, there were two things that were very challenging. Uh, the first one was using footage that wasn't mine, uh, all the GoPro footage and uh, Patrick, my, uh, my source, uh, well, he's obviously, you know, he's a, he's a Marine, he's obviously not a videographer, so. Uh, when he was filming with a GoPro, uh, he, you know, he was, he didn't hold any shots. He just, you know, moved very fast and, you know, it's a GoPro, so it's very squeaky. It just, it was extremely hard to edit footage that wasn't mine and make it work and know which one to use without being there and actually seeing exactly what was going on. So that was a very challenging aspect of that. And the second part was because it's a multimedia piece and there is an article uh, that goes with it, we had to make sure that the piece could stand on its own, so someone could watch the video and understand everything that was going on, but it had to complement the story too without boring the audience, and uh, I've never done that before either, and that was very challenging. It was very fun too. I mean, I did it with a friend, so it was fun, like, late night <laughs> work, uh, but yeah, that's most challenging, I guess. Okay. Uh, move on. Number two. Um, any more setup? Anything else you'd like to let us know before we venture into... Story number two. Yes, yeah, so this is just a scene from the documentary that we've been working on over the semester. So we're going to be screening this on May 19th, the night before our graduation. Um, and this is just one scene um, of one of the characters who will be following. We're following three characters within the documentary. So, yeah. I walked bent over um, because I had my back was broken in three places. Someone body slammed me. And once I got here, uh, there was a car accident. Someone just tapped the bumper of the van that we were in. And the hospital was going to do surgery right away, but if I was to stay in the hospital, they would have had to call Dyfus to come get my baby. And I have to get him situated. I have to find someone to take custody if I can't get someone to take him, Dyfus is going to take him, you know, D DCPMP now, <laughs> they're going to take him and it's going to be a mess trying to get him back and trying to regain custody and for nothing, you know, just because I have to have back surgery, not because, you know, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but, you know, because I can't find anybody to take him, you know, and that's just, that's hard. So, you know, it's kind of a choice, I have to make a choice between my back or my baby. It's a hard decision to make, you know, and when it comes down to it, when they're there to take your baby, <laughs> it's, it's really, it's, it's a scary feeling. You don't want, you know, you don't want to, you don't want somebody just to just take your baby away when you don't know where they're, where they're going to go or if you're going to get them back. It's hard, you know, even when it comes down to a situation like this. <laughs> but, <laughs> so we'll work it out, though. 
we'll work it out. That must have been a challenging interview. Was, was that a, a difficult part of the whole piece that you're putting together to be in that situation and see that? Um, I mean, I think, I mean, these women, there's 23 women all living together with their kids um, in this program. And they all have incredible stories and individual stories. And it's been, it's been a, a quite a challenging process for us and Stacy. I mean it's difficult but at the same time they're really open and they want to tell their stories and so I guess from that perspective you know it's it's a good experience for us and it's humbling to be able to speak to these women and for them to share their stories. Yeah. They feel like they want to talk about it because there is such a lack of that kind of centers in New Jersey too. They lived around this place for years and they didn't know that some of them abandoned like seven, nine kids before they actually got their kids back. So they feel like they want to get the word out, I think. Yeah, great. Okay. And third, shall we? I'll have her come up because she has her information and she'll plug it into the computer. So I'm actually going to give her the controls and step out of the way here for a second. I'll tell you a little bit about my story and then I'll show you some of the photos and audio that are going to go with it. Um, as I mentioned, it's a 10,000 word story. It's the longest piece that I've ever done. And um, it's exploring the surge of young street musicians or buskers that have come to New Orleans in the last five years. And uh, this year is the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. So there's a lot of talk in New Orleans, um, the birthplace of jazz and so much of great, the great American music that we know today um, about the future of the city. And so, you know, in the last several years, there's been young street musicians coming from all over the country, as far north as Canada, who are um, freight train hopping and caravanning and hitchhiking and they're picking up instruments that haven't been popular for over a century. Um, banjos, mandolins, washboards, saws that they play with bows, all kinds of quirky instruments. And, um, and they're basically revitalizing um, an interest in, in music of the Depression era. And they are wearing clothing that is representative of that aesthetic. And, um, and they're landing in New Orleans because New Orleans is one of the few cities in the country where you can still just roll into town, post up anywhere, and, and make a living, make $100 a day playing music on the street. Um, but they're controversial in the city because they are looking at, um, they're, they're looking to a lot of the older traditional jazz tunes of the city for inspiration. And they're also bringing their own kind of musical influences and creating their own sort of genre. And people are, you know, older musicians who've been in the town for, you know, decades playing music are saying, well, who are these, you know, newcomers to, to arrive in town and, and, and start, you know, kind of making themselves a part of, of, the, city's, of the city's musical culture. At the same time, you have um, young New Orleanians who grew up in, in, in the town who are playing brass band instruments, trombones and horns and everything, but instead of looking to the city's traditional music, they are looking to contemporary trends in hip hop. So all the older musicians in town who are looking to the native New Orleanians to keep the traditional music alive are disappointed because the kids who grew up there are not interested in the music. They feel like they have been pressured their entire lives to kind of preserve traditional jazz, and now they're, they're looking to hip hop instead. Um, so there's this interesting kind of interaction between the people that are coming to town and the kids that grew up there and the roles they're playing in, um, in the traditions of the city um, at this you know, really important time, 10, ten years of, uh, after hurricane that basically displaced the entire city, including the musicians. Um, so, 
I have two characters that I'm kind of following through this story. Um, this is my way of trying to keep the reader interested in, in a piece that goes on for a long time with a lot of complicated issues. Um, the first one is, is this guy named Shine who grew up in Temecula, California, and he was just dissatisfied. He wasn't happy with, um, you know, gigging at night and working, you know, a job at a burrito shop. So he just quit and started driving around the country, living out of his car, and um, and eventually ended up down in New Orleans. And then I have Rob Walker, who is a trombone player who grew up in the Lower Ninth Ward, which is, um, you know, one of the worst neighborhoods in New Orleans, and um, and he didn't really know what he was doing with his life. He was also, you know, his neighborhood is pretty much destroyed by the hurricane. And when he came back, um, you know, he was just kind of bouncing around minimum wage jobs in the service industry. And then his best friend um, in the entire world, who was a saxophone player in New Orleans, was murdered. And um, the way that he coped with the tragedy was by, you know, picking up the trombone and heading out to the street. and. Uh, and uh, he's made a life for himself in, in the French Quarter, um, playing music. So um, I'll play a little bit of the music um, of both of these characters and show you some photos. And uh, so here is Shine. Um, he's my busker. And uh, this is him here. And uh, this is him playing uh, on Royal Street in the French Quarter with his band, The Black Resonators. And this little clip here that I can play. This is them playing. Here's another photo of them uh, playing on the street so you get a sense of people. Um, and the way that I'm going to present this thesis um, is I'm going to put it on a site like WordPress or Blogger. I haven't decided who's going to host it yet. But I'll have the story, and then I'll basically put the photos in the story, and I'll also upload the um, audio files to SoundCloud and embed them. In the other band that he plays with is here. They're called Yes Man Band. They play 1920s rock and roll is what they say they play. I don't really know what that is, but... take a look at our brass band musicians. This is Rob. And here's a picture of him playing with his band. This is a funny guy who just decided to dance with them. And uh, here's some audio of them playing. <laughs> Here's another photo of them playing, and the last audio file I have. One more round of applause for our students here and the work that they put together for their classes. 
we have a few minutes. If anybody has any questions on their projects and what they've been working on, feel free to step up to the mic. So we have a few minutes. We can take a few questions. Sorry, I'm in a rush. I have a flight back to catch to California in a, in a couple of hours. Great work, amazing, absolutely moving. I have my first question is for Elena. Uh, how did you contact or hear about the source? Um, and uh, did you interview him, like personally? Yeah, so hi, uh, well, my, my friend who I did this story with, uh, he, uh, he is a US Marine as well. And they, my source and I met, uh, and him met uh, at a Marine's birthday. And then when our source was in, in Iraq, uh, he contacted um, my friend telling him, listen, I'm coming back soon. How should I handle the press? And we were like, you should do a story with us. Uh, so <laughs> my friend uh, who writes uh, contacted me and he was like, listen, I want to do a video, so come tomorrow and we'll interview this guy. And yeah, I, I sat down with him and, and interviewed him uh, for a few hours. Uh, but uh, before that, I, I researched everything and I, we had audio files and pictures and all the GoPro footage before that. So I, I did extensive research before interviewing him. So he had already captured the footage before you contacted him? Uh, well, when he was in contact with my friend, when he told him, like, I'm coming back soon, we're like, well, we want to do a story on you, so please get as much GoPro footage as you can. They usually still get GoPro footage, uh, but we asked him to, you know, get more, and we kind of just walk around and show us, like, you know, the situation. Okay, that's great. And uh, um, I have a question for, yeah, for you. Um, do, do you have music background or like you were interested in the music or is it the backstory of the characters that uh, kind of interested you or was it both? Like how did you get, decide on doing this piece? Uh, both. I spent a year in New Orleans before coming here uh, reporting for the Times-Picayune and the Gambit and um, I'm, al I'm also a jazz musician so uh, I was, yeah, interested in the music and interested in New Orleans and interested in all of these young people who are coming to town. Great, thank you. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, your, uh, your projects are all fantastic. I've been kind of blown away. Um, so this question is mainly for Lou, because you did the uh, story on the Rehab Center. Mm -hmm. um, but really, any of you, and feel free to join in. Um, so uh, my question is, how are you able to find sources who were willing to speak about you know, these, these tough situations and um, you know, willing to give their names and be filmed? Um, a few years ago, I did a uh, reporting project in China where I profiled a few parents and their children who um, were, they had uh, terminal cancer. So many of them were willing to, you know, or well, a few of them were willing to talk about their stories, but not so keen on, you know, telling their, uh, their full names or um, being filmed, things like that. So, yeah. Right. Um... I, so the way we found it, it's been really long. It had, like, we took a really long time to find these women who would agree for us to talk. Because first we wanted to talk about the lack of access to drug treatment in New Jersey in general, and we went to many doctors who referred us to different people. And I think when we got to that center, we were referred by a psychiatrist who, to, who told us to get there. And I think these women really think that they're forgotten by society and they're so surprised that anyone would come and even try to film them. So it's been really, finding them has been hard, but once we found them, it's been actually like they're really, like half of them are really open to talk to us. The other half is just like, yeah. but, and they're open to give their names and they're, because they're really proud of what they're doing. You know, we're not catching them like, you know, doing drugs where you get, where they're actually trying to you know, detox and they're getting their children back. They're really proud of what they're doing. So I think once you kind of like convey to them that you want to show what they're doing and how great it is and that you want, we want to show that these centers exist and that more centers should open, I think that kind of like convinced them. I don't know if that answers. Yeah. And if you want to. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's also about kind of like establishing trust with them as well. Like 
even though we're filming a lot of the time, we do spend a lot of time just kind of like chilling with them and hanging out with them. And I think, you know, having that relationship with them allows them to feel more comfortable with the camera there. Thank you. I think we only have time for about two more questions, unfortunately, for this session. So I'll ask to the, whoever, we have the two people that were here, I think we're first. So we'll have two more questions and then if the students are able to stay for a little bit. If you, if anybody wants to ask them anything individual at the information fair, right down the hall in the world room, um, if you would just be willing to stay. And if anybody has questions, you can find them directly down the hall. So we'll do these two right here. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I'm just wondering, um, you know, from your personal experience, if you recommend, uh, you know, as we prepare to come into school, uh, to have some thoughts as far as the types of stories we would like to pursue uh, for our projects and for other classwork. Um, sure, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> um, I mean, definitely. Uh, also, you know, there are a lot of stories. If you're passionate about something, definitely think about pursuing that. Then you have your master's project, which really gives you the ability to pursue a very long story in a diversity of mediums. You can do photography, video, audio, or just print. Uh, so definitely come, you know, if, you, if you're passionate about something, definitely come with the ideas in mind uh, and, you know, stories that you want to cover, but also um, be, be also, like, open to be surprised. Like, the, the marine story, I was, I did not think I was going to do a story on ISIS this year. I, I was, that even crossed my, I did not think I was going to do that, and it just kind of happened. So be open to, like, things coming to you, but definitely come with ideas. I mean, this is why we're here. We're here to, to find the stories and tell them. So, yeah, and I feel, I mean, I kind of learned here to be that sounds cheesy, like to be ambitious about what you want to do. I oh, used yeah. to look for small stories that I think I could tell, and for example, for this story, we wanted to talk about you know lack of treatment. Those are really broad topics that you feel, and then if you really search into one topic that you're really interested, you will find a story. You know, like you don't have to look for specific stories. And I think, yeah, I learned that here. Thanks. I love all of your stories. They were all great. Well, I have an extension of his question, actually. So I'd like to know, what is the process that you use in regards to finding out if a story is really good or worthy? Because there are so many great stories to tell, so what have you used as work for you? <laughs> stories are everywhere all the time, and uh, they also change a lot. You know, you find a story and you think you know exactly, you know, what your angle is going to be or who your sources are going to be, and it ends up unfolding in a completely unpredictable way. Um, how do you know if it's a good story idea? It's funny that you should ask that, because when David Remnick came to speak, uh, the editor of The New Yorker, about a month ago, I asked him the exact same question, and he said to me, I write it on my hand and I think about it. <laughs> you know, I don't know how to know, you know, if a story, if a story is a good idea. I think that you will spend your entire life as a journalist wondering. But all you can do is if you have a seed of an idea, just pursue it as much as you can. Talk to everyone that you can. And um, this, this school has uh, so many brilliant minds, your fellow journalists as well as your professors, that bouncing ideas off of people is always a great way to go. And, um, and also, I think that um, if you can find a way to make a story relevant now, then that's always a great way to sell it. Why, why is this a story today instead of last year or five years ago? Yeah, I've, yeah. it's important to, I mean, in video especially, every story is not made for video. I think we learned yeah. that. So you kind of have to find someone who has a journey that you can talk about something specific and I think once you find that you actually do have a story before that yeah yeah stories are, are char character driven if you don't have a good character it can be a good idea but if you don't have a great source a great character to follow and who can illustrate your story it's not gonna go anywhere yeah. great <laughs> one one final round of applause for these four and having them share their stories with us <laughs> once again if anybody still wanted to ask them a question, wasn't able to, I'll just ask them maybe to hang out for 10 minutes or so in the world room directly on the other end of the hallway. 
um, and you can meet with them there. There are several things you can choose to do right now if you, if you look at the agenda. Um, in this room here, if you'd like to stay, there'll be another financial aid presentation. Um, there is a student information fair in the World Room right down the hall until 2 o'clock where you can speak with some other students um, in some of our affinity groups, other offices in the journalism school and more campus-wide offices will have some tables of information for you. You're welcome to go to lunch. There is a sheet in your packet that will list some options for you. If you're not familiar, you can go out and explore the local neighborhood and grab something to eat and come back. Um, also from 1 to 3, um, we in admissions and career services will have office hours if you want to come meet with us individually. So if you want to um, venture out to get something to eat, um, go down the hall to the information fair, you're welcome to do that now. If you want to stay here, Taryn Almanzar, the Director of Financial Aid Admission, and Edwin Isaac, Assistant Director, will come up and do another financial aid presentation for you, which will start here in just a couple minutes. So again, thank you.
Hello, everyone. Hi. As most of you know, um, I'm Taryn Almansar, and I'm the Director for Financial Aid and Admissions. I have interacted with most of you either by phone, email, or in person. And once again, welcome and congrats. You've also had the chance to communicate with my colleague, Edwin Isaac, who is the Assistant Director for Financial Aid and Admissions. And I know that he's been corresponding with a lot of you, if not um, most of you, by now. Um, I'm going to try to make this short, and I'm not going to say fun, because this is not the fun part of um, your whole experience here. But the more informed you are, the better off you will be once you walk in through those doors. We will have an opportunity for you to ask questions. We will also have office hours from 1 to 3 if you want to go into more details about your particular situation. We will also be here next week and the following week. So feel free to reach out um, to us. We're here to answer your questions. There's nothing that you should feel like you should know. There's, there's no such thing when it comes to educational financing. And if you're anything like me, as I usually say in my individual um, counseling sessions, after you have walked away, you're gonna think of like 30 other questions that you should have asked. Please do yourself the favor of just reaching out to us. We're here as the resource. I cannot emphasize that enough. So with that said, I'm just gonna walk you through what we will be discussing today. Just the definition of what is educational financing, what can you expect from us? What are the different offices within campus that are here to help you and to answer questions regarding payment of your tuition and bills, financial aid, student loans, refunds, and I'll go over what all of those terms mean. Your, where are you going to be accessing and how are they going to be getting in contact with you in regards to billing? couple of financing options, a timeline so that you know or have some sort of calendar of when you should be completing certain things. And um, we'll, as I mentioned, we'll have an opportunity for questions. And then um, I'll follow up with the summary. And without further ado, everything that we do here at the university, from the counseling and financial aid to how you're being billed, um, it's grounded in federal regulations. So nine times out of 10, when you're having a conversation with us, we'll start off by saying, as per federal regulations, we're unable to talk to your parents. As per federal regulations, we can't allow you to borrow them anymore. So it's not that we want to be the office of no, although some people say that you're the office of no. It's just that we're grounded in those regulations. And I think the more aware you are of them, the better um, we can manage your expectations and you can plan accordingly. So. Federal regulations dictate that university has to determine tuition and fees. We have to be upfront about it. And I know that we have sent out an email telling you, this is your tuition and fees. These are your estimated living expenses. And um, here's the penalties. This is when you have to do it. That's because it's not to scare you or to bombard you with information. But again, it's because of um, the view. And we, we actually believe in that that the more information you have, the more informed you are, you will be more, better prepared to come in and do this as an investment because it is an investment and that's the way that you should be approaching this. And then, of course, we let you know about your financing options. So what is the cost of attendance? This is something that we are going to be constantly throwing at you. What's your budget? What's your cost of attendance? Cost of attendance is made up of tuition and fees. And this is what we call non-negotiable, meaning this is what the university is charging you in order for you to graduate with your um, education from the J school. Added to that are your living expenses. And these are things that sometimes people overlook or they say, well, you know what, I'll take care of that later. No. Your living expenses, you have to think about that now as well. What are living expenses? Your rent, your personal expenses, your food, your travel, all of the things that the university will not bill you, but that you need to take into account in order to sustain yourself. So again, that is the cost of attendance. So with that said, what are the estimated tuition and fees per program per academic year? We're using the word estimated because the trustees of the universities have not as of yet um, set what the tuition is going to be for the following academic year, which is the 25-2016 that you guys are walking into. 
but we're estimating based on prior figures that this is what it will be. Once it has been determined, we will be sending you an email out and telling you it has been determined, this is the tuition and fees, this is what you will be charged um, by the university. If you're in the MA full time, it's, it's approximately 58,167. MS full time, approximately 63,257. MS part time, 36,404 per, um, per year. If you're in the documentary semester, you're going to have a, an extra semester, and we're estimating that that's going to be approximately 11,415. If you're in the dual degree with engineering, that's 63,668. And now we're up to the estimated living expenses. We're saying that you're going to need approximately $2,725 per month. Um, for those of you who are watching us and via live stream, more likely than not, you're not in New York, um, or for those of you who are out of state, it is New York City, is it is one of the most expensive cities in the world. So as you are approaching your living expenses, keep that in the back of your mind. What do I mean by that? These expenses are within your control. Meaning, if we're telling you, for example, your rent is approximately 1,188. For some of you, you will be getting roommates, and that means then that that rent um, amount will be lower. For some of you, depending on where it is that you're living, that might be a little bit higher. So always keep in mind how you can mitigate the cost without really also affecting your ability to go through the program. So in utilities, we're estimating that you're gonna need about $325. And utilities usually in New York include um, the uh, light, uh, gas, and um, your cell phone and all that good stuff. Food, again, it's very expensive. We're estimating that it's 574. And no, this is not taken into account when you go out to restaurants or when you're buying food. This is we're estimating that you're going to be bringing your food from home, that you're going to be cooking, that you're gonna be bringing in your coffee and all that good stuff. Your travel expenses, about $168 a month. And again, that's based on public transportation, not on taxis, not on you having a car or anything else. And then personal, about 470. Um, so that's what an average uh, person spends out in New York in their living expenses. There are three different finance financial offices that you will be dealing with. Our office, obviously, which is the Office of Admissions and Financial Aid. And we will probably be your first point of reference. We might not be able to have the answers for you or to take care of the issues that you need to, but at least we'll be able to point you and tell you where you need to go. But in the back of your mind, you should keep the following two offices. The Student Service Center. This is the, it located in Kent Hall, which is in another building here on the campus. And, it's, and the following two offices, I should say, they're university-wide offices. So they are doing administrative duties for the entire university. The Student Service Center is the office that will be sending you your bill. So if you have any questions about the charges on there, of the payments on there, this is the office that you will go to. If you need to show proof that you are registered here in a degree granting program, especially for those of you that have borrowed federal loans and you want to go into deferment, this is the office that you will go to and that they will give you the official um, proof that you're here registered. You're able to obtain that proof of registration the week that you start here. So if you were to go there now, they're not gonna be able to produce anything. So during that first week, even that first day, you can go there and they'll send out the proof to, to the lenders. Um, the Office of Cashiering, it's also located in Kent Hall, and that's if you want to make in-person payments or you want to take a personal check, that's the office that you will go to. And don't worry about it, I'm going to be bombarding you with a lot of information in offices and whatnot. If you do decide to enroll here, this is not the last time that you will be hearing from us. Um, also, during orientation, we will go through all of these different offices and what to expect um, while you're here. Okay, on your bill, what is it that you're going to see on your bill? You're going to see tuition, your fees. If you have university housing, and depending on the housing that you have, um, they'll can probably charge you 
via the university billing system, which means that you would be billed twice in the academic year and it'll be one lump sum. When you're signing your housing agreement, they'll tell you if they're going to be expecting a monthly payment, um, if it's gonna be charged via university bill, um, and when are the deadlines and all of that. So again, as you're signing your contract with university housing, make sure that that's one of the things you understand so that you know what to expect. Bill notifications, how are you notified? The university has moved um, almost 100% from paper email, uh, mailing. So everything will be sent to you via email. What that means, once you get that university email address, make sure that you're keeping on top of it, that you're reading, and the university is going to bombard you with so many emails that after your second month, you're just probably gonna scroll through and you're like, I don't need to read this. Do yourself the favor of at least skimming to see that email that you're being sent, there's nothing that you need to do, that there are no follow-up steps. You will be able to gain access to your bill. Again, they'll send you that email, but it's not as though embedded in that email, it's gonna show you what you owe. There is the student portal, which is called Student Services Online. Um, and again, we won't go into details about that. If you enroll here, we will guide you through how to go and access your bill. But it's a portal, you go in there and you will be able to see your bill. Key things to note for those of you that uh, might have parents, significant others who will be helping you paying for your um, time here, they will not have access to this part of it unless you explicitly give access to them. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Payment options. You're able to make online or paper check. Um, you can transfer the funds via wire. You can make the in-person payment, which is, um, as I mentioned, in the cashiering office. Bill due dates. Hang on to these dates um, because there are penalties if you don't pay the bill by, this, um, by the designated deadline. The university will not charge you a lump sum, which usually people, that's what they think. Oh, I'm, am I going to have to pay the entire amount of my tuition and bills at once? No. If you are in the part-time program and you begin in the summer, the summer due date is Thursday, June 11th, 2015. If you're um, in the full-time program or in the part-time as well, the fall semester will be due September 18th. And the spring, January 29th. What are the consequences of late payments? Late charges. Um, the first late charge that the university will, um, will give you, it's $150 irrespective of what you owe. You owe $2, you owe three, you owe five, $150 automatically will be tacked on. After that, um, you, after the uh, 150, it's about 1.1% of whatever your balance is that they'll continue to charge you. Um, some universities will not allow you to register or they'll drop your classes if you don't make payments by that day. That's not how Columbia works. It says, okay, go through your program, finish the semester, but then you will not be able to register for the following one unless your balance is under $1,000. You will also not be able to get any transcript. You will not be able to get your diploma. So in essence, you will not have any proof that you've completed the program and that you have graduated from here. And eventually, they'll send you to collections. You don't want to go into collections because if you owe, let's say, $2,000, it's no longer $2,000. It'll probably be $4,000, $6,000, depending on what the collection agency is already charging you. So really avo avoid trying to go into collections. Come in, talk to us, and let's figure out a plan for you to make the payments. We'll have an opportunity for questions later. Financing options. Now that I've walked you through the payments and bills and all that good stuff. What are my options? What can I help or what's, what kind of help is out there to help me mitigate the cost? Full-time students, and I know that you've heard this throughout the um, entire open house, but I needed to reemphasize that again. Please, 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 please do not count on working um, to help you mitigate the cost. I know that will be a wonderful way if you were able to do that. Even some people will say, well, how about work study? Even with that, Work study um, are usually jobs that are open on campus, but they're administrative offices and offices that have schedules. And given what you have to do, chances are you're not gonna be able to have the time or actually the energy as well to go into work. There's the payment plan. Remember how I mentioned those specific deadlines that you have to make the payment? 
with the payment plan, which cannot be used for the summer semester, so it has to be used only for fall and spring, um, you're able to divide your, the payment that you're going to be paying out of your own pocket, not with loans, not with scholarship. Let's say you have savings, let's say you have checkings, or let's say somebody's gonna be able to help you. You're able to divide that into 10 months. Um, so let's say instead of making um, $1,000 payment in the fall and $1,000 in the spring, um, you will be making you know, uh, $200 per month. So it's a nice way of sparsing it out so that you don't have to come up with a lump sum at the same time. You're also able to do it for one semester, which will mean that the months um, are spread out into five months. It's not a loan, it's not something that you have to apply, but it, there is a one-time $45 fee um, in order for you to be able to enroll. And the first payment will be due early July. And again, you will be receiving notifications of all of this throughout, but this is just something so that you can have that in the back of your mind. Scholarships. There's two categories of scholarship, the J school one, which we have already allocated and which you should have received an email from us with your admissions decision if you were eligible for scholarship. Um, you know, all of the scholarship funding that we receive or that we are able to give out, it's based on donations that are made to the school. And once you graduate, we'll be knocking on your door saying, you wanna give money for scholarships? Um, and then you'll be like, no, let me get a job first. But, um, they come with specific guidelines, specific things that the donors are looking for. Um, you know, merit has to be taken into account as determined by the admissions committee, financial need as determined by the forms and documents that you have submitted, um, and then the applications as well. Then we have the second category, which is outside scholarships. And these are offered by private organizations. There are tons of money out there um, from people that want to give students money. And they have their own deadlines, they have their own application requirements, they have their specific um, method of selecting the recipient, the specific amounts. And you will find people that will tell you this is a waste of your time. I'm here to tell you it's not. I've seen checks as small as 200 and as big as $40,000 come across my desk. Just to put it in perspective, this year we received close to $200,000 come in from outside scholarships that students have brought in and we have approximately 34, 35 students that have actually received those scholarships. So take the time now to do the research, apply for everything and anything under the sun that you think you might be eligible for. We start you off with a listing on our site and it's pretty comprehensive, but it's not the list. So we encourage each and every one of you to do your own research based on things that make you who you are your country of citizenship, areas of interest, your demographics, your financial status. Um, and then, you know, just really do the research out there. Three main ways to know if it's a scam because there are scammers out there. Um, it's if they're asking you for a fee to apply for the scholarship, don't do it. Um, nine times out of 10 foundations will never ask you for, for you to pay for that. If they're asking for personal identifiers, social security numbers, um, and everything else don't apply. And if, they're want, and if they want to gain access to your financials um, records such as bank accounts, credit cards, and everything else. Student loans, and with that, I'll pass it along to my colleague. Mm -hmm. Just going back to what Taryn said about outside scholarships, uh, we sent you a spreadsheet probably two or three months back um, if you'd like, either you can go search on the website or just email me and I'll send you a link. We actually have a site of, um, with those scholarships which we try to update um, as frequently as we, as we can and as we get, in, get new information. Um, as you said, my name is Edwin Isaac. I'm Assistant Director of Financial Aid and Admissions. Um, and as Terrence said in the beginning, also it's not the uh, so fun part of your day here, but it is um, good information to have. You need to know what all your sources are uh, to you know, make your payment essentially. So I'm gonna be talking about your loan options. Um, if you completed a FAFSA, most of you should have received a, an, an award letter with your federal loans. Um, in order to be eligible for that, uh, you need to be a citizen or permanent resident, enrolled for at least six credits, which all of you will be no matter what program you are in. If you're a male, you should have um, 
register for the selective service if you were out of the country at any point or if you uh, are an international and you came here and you you know established citizenship based on when you came here you should have um, also registered for selective service um, and of course that's something uh, we would notify you of and you cannot be in default of any previous loans so the first type of loan uh, I'll discuss a little bit is what's called a federal unsubsidized loan this is the loan that's guaranteed uh, to us uh, students um, this loan currently has an interest rate of 6.21 percent um, that's for this current year the federal government is going to uh, establish a new percentage uh, after after late May early June also you'll see there what's called an origination fee which is about 1.073 percent so what that means is if you request a loan for ten thousand dollars you're not going to get a loan for ten thousand all right the, the award letter uh, I gave you I, I sent to you guys it, it has an award value of twenty thousand five hundred what that really comes out to net is twenty thousand two eighty okay here's an example of what an award letter should look like for a part-time student what you see there is 20,500 divided evenly between the summer and the fall term and then another full allotment of 20,500 in the spring and then the following summer no unsubsidized loan and then your last two terms you get another 20,500 divided evenly okay you should expect each term to be roughly 13 to 12 thousand dollars per semester so you've seen that first spring term, you're getting a lot of money. For, this is just for part-time students now. I'll get to the MS and the MA in um, the next slide. So in that, that first spring semester, you're receiving almost double in loans than what the, your bill will be from Columbia. This is not including your living expenses. All right? So what you need to do is try to manage that money for that following summer. Okay? And certainly come see me after this presentation or when we have um, office hours I can go into more detail for an MS or an MA student it's really easy it's just 20,500 divided evenly between the fall and the spring semester so moving on to the next federal loan option this is what's called a federal graduate plus loan this loan is not guaranteed all right, there's a credit review. It's a, it's a very quick process, actually, for me to do it. Um, but what you need to know is that you can't um, have be in default of a loan. You can't be uh, greater than 90 days delinquent uh, in a loan. You can't be uh, or ever had a, a bankruptcy in the last five years. Those are some things that uh, would deny you, uh, you know, from obtaining that loan. The interest rate is higher. It's at 7.21%, and again, that will be updated in late May, early June. And you see there that there's also a higher, a much higher origination fee. But at the same time, you're able to take out much more in a Graduate PLUS loan. You can take out up to the cost of attendance, minus any other aid that you've received. So let's just say, for example, the cost of attendance is 90. You're getting an unsubsidized loan, let's just say, for 20. You can take out a Graduate PLUS loan for $70,000, if approved. So the process to get these loans, the first thing you have to do is what's called the FAFSA, which hopefully all of you have already done. And then once you get the loan, you see that in your award letter, what you have to do is called a master promissory note and an entrance counseling. You have to do that for both loans. So you have to do, if you're getting the PLUS loan along with the unsubsidized loan, you need to do two master promissory notes and two entrance counselings. Your last loan option uh, is private loans. Um, this is, for everybody can apply for a private loan. Um, citizens can apply for it, international students can apply for it, but most likely they will need a co-signer. Uh, same thing with the Graduate Plus, you can apply for up to your cost of attendance minus any other aid that you've received. If look at the next slide here actually as a comparison. The, the big difference between the loans is that, in, um, excuse me, um, private loans are usually variable interest rates. Okay, all the federal loans are fixed rates, unsub and the plus loan. They're all fixed rate loans. 
So if you want to take the time, you can research private loans. Some of them offer decent rates, but understand that they might, essentially they might change later. They might be great interest rates up front, but in the back end, they might get you. I'll just go through another example real quickly here of what an MS student would look like. So the cost of attendance of 93000 if they receive aid and scholarship and loans of about 32000 they'll have a shortfall of 61000 we, we all sent you, um, excuse me, we sent all of you a, an email with your shortfall, right, your cost of attendance, and I think we had it in red what your shortfall is. That's what you have to think about. How are you going to cover your shortfall? And here are, you know, here are your options, essentially, your plus loan, private loan, payment plan, outside scholarship, a combination of all that. Um, what I can do for you is just contact me. I can send you a spreadsheet showing you uh, a breakdown of both your fall and your spring term or even for um, part-time students, all six of your terms, of all the aid you're going to receive and your expected charges and see what the actual out-of-pocket is. That's money that you have to pay the school, right? Your living expenses won't be on there because hopefully some of you will be able to uh, do better than what we put uh, estimate for you. But if you just contact me, I can send you out a spreadsheet so you can see what those actual out-of-pocket expenses will be uh, directly to the school. All right. You guys look a little sleepy to me. <laughs> yeah, good night last night. <laughs> That's the, I know. I'm like, oh, and this is pretty, uh, this is not the most um, exciting and riveting information. But I do hope that it's been informative. We, are, we welcome any feedback um, that you might want to give to us. Um, things that wasn't so clear or anything else. So with that said, let's talk a little bit about timeline, things that you should be doing and when. Before May 1st, before you submit your enrollment fee, which is non-refundable, um, make sure that you have a set plan and you say, you know what, I know what my cost of attendance, remember, which is tuition and fees and your living expenses, and I have already a game plan as to how it is that I'm going to mitigate that cost as to how it is that I'm going to pay for it. Thank you. Um, yes. Review your credit history. Make sure that there's nothing off there. You have approximately four months, five months to figure it out and to fix things that are in error there. So make sure you do that. Um, obtain a co-signer if you realize, oh, well, my credit history is not as great as I thought it was. Or if you are an international student and you want to pursue, um, the private loan, that's the time to start knocking on people's door and saying the loan is under my name, but I need you to be my, to act as my co-signer. And really research the outside scholarships. I, I cannot emphasize that enough. Pay attention to the deadlines, pay attention to what are the um, application materials. Some of the scholarships will say, well, you know what, the deadline is in October, it's in December, and that's fine. Gather the materials now, write the essay that it might be needed. If you need a transcript, just get everything together so that when the application opens up, you have it and you can just submit it because I guarantee you that once you walk in through those doors as a student, time is going to fly by. And the last thing you want to do is to be worrying about all of this. What most of our students will do is that they'll think of the worst case scenario and they say, I need to borrow X amount of dollars. And then as they're getting their outside scholarships or hopefully if we're able to offer you any scholarship, you start lowering your loan. You're saying, you know what, I received $1,000 in scholarship, lower my loan. I received $2,000, let's lower my loan. So your goal through all of this is to borrow um, as little as possible. So always keep that in the back of your mind as you're going through this. Sign up for the payment plan if that is something that you want to do and want to pursue. Sign up as soon as you receive your university bill because there are deadlines and there are things that you need to um, figure out. Apply for your student loans at least 90 days before the semester starts. You can apply for the loan at any point during the academic year, but we recommend 90 days before because then that's giving you the flexibility again of making sure that all the documents are in, that um, you've passed the credit, his, you know, the, pr the credit check, that everything is in order so that when you walk in again through those doors, you don't want this to be even a concern. This is already settled. This is not something, a weight that you're carrying um, as you're going through the program. 
So 90 days, um, what does that mean? If you are in the part-time program, well, you don't have 90 days. Um, you have a little bit less than that. That's May 1st. If you are in the MS full-time program, May 10th. If you're in the dual degree with engineering, that's May 10th as well. And if you're in the MA program, that's June 8th. And we'll be sending out emails as well and reminders saying this is the time to do it, apply, apply, here are the documents, this is what you need to fill out. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Again, I know we have bombarded you with a lot of information, not just here, but also throughout, um, from the time that you've started thinking about applying to Columbia, I know that we've been sending information out. So questions, and if you have questions, if you go to the, can go to the mic so the people that are watching us via live stream can hear you. Hi. Okay. Um, so I was just wondering, so you mentioned applying to scholarships next year with December deadlines. How, basically, how would that scholarship end up helping us? Because that was one of my concerns, feeling like I missed last year's. Does that go toward the next semester? I it, yes, or, it depends on the foundation. Yeah. Some foundations will have the December deadline, but then they'll let you know in the spring and you can apply towards the academic year. Okay. So it goes both ways. It can be that they're saying, you know what, it's a December deadline, for example, and it's for the following academic year, and some will say it's a December deadline and you can use it for the current one. So okay. you really have to pay attention to those things. Thank you. Um, you said that we can lower uh, how much we're asking for in loans as scholarships come in. Mm -hmm. Say I apply by May 10th for $90,000. Mm -hmm. Then over the next few months, 10,000 comes in. How, at what point would the loan, would I receive the loan? At what point can I ask them to give me less so that it doesn't affect the interest rate? What, what's the timeline that's, for all that? Yes, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Um, your scholarship and the student loans will be divided each semester. So for example, let's just take the fall and spring for simplicity's sake, and you're getting 20,500. 10,250 will be dispersed in July, 10,250 will be dispersed in January. Interest starts accruing on that first $10,000. So it's not as though the interest will start accruing for the entire amount of the loan, only the amount that it is dispersed. As far as when you are able to request for the loans to be lowered, it is really at any point. Obviously, if it is before the, mo the money hits your account or is disperses, then that's better because then there hasn't been any interest that's been accruing or origination fee. But even if the money has dispersed already, let's say you get your, the loan disperses in July, September, you have this amount of money comes in, we can still lower that, we can still send that back. Does that answer your question? Yes, and uh, how does that factor in with private loans? With private loans, it's the same. It's the same thing. Um, they will be dividing it equally um, between the semesters that you're here. And again, we will be sending those funds back. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Um, how long after we've updated or submitted our FAFSA will we get the email about awards? About awards? Usually it's what, Edwin, maybe? No, it should be the same week, maybe. Give it seven, 10 business days. If you don't, uh, just send me an email. Yeah, OK. Because um, I know that when I spoke to financial aid, um, I was told the February 1st deadline wasn't necessarily the deadline for that. For the FAFSA? Yes. No. No. That the, was the scholarship, applica the scholarship application. The, right, the same for that also. I'm very surprised because that you're looking at the financial aid office. <laughs> I actually spoke with, with you. But. We know. We don't. Um, the February 1st deadline, that was the deadline, and we sent various notices saying that's the deadline if you want to be considered for scholarship. If you want to borrow the loans, that is not the deadline. Okay. And that's, you know, capturing the sound bite. Um, that is not the deadline. You can apply for loans at any point up to a month before the, the semester ends. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, in terms of graduate plus loan, um, with entrance counseling or entrance, whatever, entrance counseling, will you guys tell us after, um, like, will you notify us in some way once that's been completed? Are you, like, alerted on your end? Yeah, so let's say you want a graduate plus loan. You're going to, Edwin, I want a graduate plus loan. So I'm going to send you an application. Mm -hmm. You just, it's just two pages, and then you just send it back to me. I do a credit check. 
yes or no. I let you know that you've been, let's just say for example, you've been approved. I'd be like, you need to complete A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. And then I'm gonna wait a couple weeks before the aid's supposed to disperse and see who hasn't done their requirements. And then I'll notify you again and say, you haven't done your master promissory note yet. Go ahead and get that done so everything disperses on time. So the first step is to contact you first and tell yeah. you that we're interested? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. No, and no again, problem. that might sound like a little bit backwards, but federal regulations require us to do that. Like you have to start, initiate the process. Okay, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so I have a question about scholarships, specifically mm -hmm. the J school scholarships. Uh -huh. As people like make their final decisions, then maybe some people will choose to go elsewhere, and so the finances will kind of be reshuffled. Um, is there any possibility that other students will be offered scholarships in the J school based on uh, those decisions? I'm glad you asked that question. That's a really good question. Um, there is the possibility, but the probability of it, it's mm -hmm. unknown. And why do I say that? Um, it depends how much comes back mm -hmm. and what are the eligibility requirements tied into that scholarship. Mm -hmm. So given those factors is that we would be able to know and then be able to reallocate those funds because really that's what you're asking us, you know, for people that decline the offer, what happens with that money? And it's really dependent on those factors. So, okay. what, so that's why we strongly urge everyone to make a decision with the money that you have in hand, in your pocket right now. Anything that comes in afterwards, it's sort of like sweetening the pie or the icing on the cake. I'm, I'm a foodie, so of course I'm going to relate it to food. Mm -hmm. But um, it's something that, again, please, please, please make your decisions with the money that you have in hand, even if you're thinking of borrowing the student loans. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question about the scholarship aid application. So there were those essays that we wrote, um, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering whether the award has been, like those essays have been factored into the award? Or yes, yes, they have been. And that's actually um, a very good feedback that we've been hearing from a lot of you actually, because in our email notification we said scholarship. We should really say scholarship and fellowship financial aid information because the decisions already have been made for those. Okay. So. And is there like a breakdown of what we actually receive? Yes, from that? you will have a breakdown of the money that you actually receive um, later on in the fall semester. We'll be sending that out. And the reason for that is that we need to know that you're actually enrolled here and then we will be letting you the names of it. Then our development department will be reaching out to almost all of you that have received scholarship aid either to talk to the donors depending on what the donor wants or for you to meet them, write a letter, phone call or whatever the case may be. Okay, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, you mentioned that if you're doing the full-time program, uh, mm -hmm. you would recommend not working. Mm -hmm. If you're in the part-time program, six mm -hmm. hours of credit, uh, how many hours of work would you recommend? That is really a conversation you should have with Elena, but I will tell Sweet. you that most of our students that are in the part-time program are working full-time, and that's why they're doing it as a part-timer. However, um, you should at least have one day of the work week that you're able to dedicate to reporting. And what most of our part-timers will do is that they'll talk um, or have a conversation with their employers about that. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, I guess it's a question for you about the current class and sort of for everyone else. How many people do this with all loans? Like no aid, no scholarships. Obviously we hope scholarships come in. Is it extremely ill-advised to borrow the whole thing? Is anyone besides me considering that? <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately you're not the only one. And they are students that do borrow the entire amount. There's no right or wrong answers, but you have to make an informed decision. You have to, my advice personally, I'm very visual, so I need to see concrete things in order for things to make sense to me, and especially when it comes to finances. My advice is to go to studentloans.gov. Um, it's by the Department of Education, and what I tell students to do, they have there what it's called the student um, loan calculators, repayment calculators, that's the correct, mm -hmm. correct term, right? Repayment mm -hmm. calculators. And I always say, start off with the worst case scenario, the $90,000, and plug it in. And plug in the, you know, what you think will be the lowest salary that you could possibly make when you're out there. 
And what that'll do is that it'll give you a breakdown of what the different repayment options are, how much you will be paying on a monthly basis and throughout the life of the loans. And seeing those numbers can cause one or two things, and I've seen that all the time. Either you say, oh, I can handle the monthly payment, um, and if I'm in a tight bind, if I'm not making enough money, I know that the federal government is going to work with me and not going to negatively affect my credit score, and I'm okay with that. And some people will look at the overall amount that you're gonna be paying um, throughout the life of the loan, and they say, oh my Lord, I get this is just not for me. I, I can't handle that. Um, so it's a very personal decision. It's something for you to approach very cautiously, very um, coming in informed as to what that will mean. You guys are done in a very short amount of time. So repayment is around the corner, literally. So really look into that um, as you are exploring the option of barn, as you're exploring um, coming into the J school. I will say the same thing um, if you're looking at private loans. Um, just look to see what other repayment options. Some lenders will tell you if you're a day late, you're late. And they'll tack on fees, and they'll report it to your credit score, and you know, just be conscious of that. Um, the same thing with the federal loans. I mean, the federal loans are, they're a lot more flexible when it comes to that, where they'll work with you as long as you're in good standing. This is, I cannot emphasize that enough. Even for those of you who have barred undergraduate loans and are coming in here, make sure that if you do register here or someplace else, that you go into deferment. Don't just assume all they'll know. They'll work with you as long as you're in good standing. Once you go into default, um, I'll use a colloquial word that most of my students will use. They're vicious. They're, you know, they'll start garnishing your wages. You can't borrow anymore until you're in good standing. You can't get aid anyplace else. It'll go into your credit score, your credit history. So just be mindful of all of that. Thank you. You're welcome. I also, I just like, I'm sorry, I just want to add to that too. There are a number of students who are taking out a substantial graduate plus loan to cover essentially the entire cost of attendance. Um, of course, do what she says, use the repayment calculator. And I know most of you won't be able to work while you're in the program, but also think about beginning repayment immediately, at least on the interest. You can do that as well. That's an option that you have, so you can you know, minimize what you have to pay later. Okay. Okay, so you kind of answered my first question, but there's no repayment penalty if you start repaying no. during, okay. No, there isn't. And then the second question is, so if you're in the documentary program, is that treated like a separate semester? Is that something you apply for next year? That is correct, okay. yes. Yes, you will be reapplying, and we will let you know. Okay. We send out email notices. That's why we said we're gonna bombard you with emails and all of that. So really pay attention okay. to all of that. And then my other question is with disbursement, if like a lot of us are looking for housing and like coming into New York, when is that date and how do we like plan for that? Excellent question. I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the disbursement is at the end of July, but you will not get a refund, which is what the university calls that excess money that you are getting to pay for your living expenses until probably the middle of August. So what we recommend students to do is to come in with at least you know, a month of you know, reserves for you to be able to cover yourself. Um, and then if you do in, uh, decide to, to enroll and come here, we will also be sending you information on how to sign up for what the university calls direct deposit, which basically what they'll do is that that money that you're borrowing or that you're getting for living expenses, they'll transfer it automatically into your bank account. So if you're not if you're not signed up for that, and that usually like the money disperses, let's say, uh, towards the end of July, within the end of the first week of August or the second week, the latest, that money will be in your bank account. If you don't sign up for a direct deposit, it'll literally take months for the university to cut out a check for you, and then for them to mail it out, and then for you to receive it, and it's just not worth it, if you ask me. Yes, can you go to the mic? I know some banks are like really shitty with that shit stuff. Sorry, <laughs> Jennifer. Do you recommend like to have a specific bank that works really good with Columbia? Um, no, I can't endorse okay. any bank. 
but they are um, the I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but they are some um, banks around campus okay and um, there is another bank that's within here if you go to learner hall you'll okay. be able to see that their office there um, just find out what other services that they offer to the students mm -hmm. and sometimes they'll have um, promotions and, and, okay. and things like that so but again there is a couple of banks around campus and if they're on a campus, then usually that means that most of our students are going to them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I want to add to some of your question uh, a little bit mm -hmm. to that. Um, so if you're a doc student, that's a third semester for you, you'll be eligible to receive another allotment of 20,500 that third semester. Okay, that's important to know. Yeah. And also, very important, what he was talking about, that summer term when you get that disbursement. So you won't get that refund to the middle of August and you're getting possibly a rent agreement for August 1st your landlord wants his or her money August 1st, right? They don't care, they don't care about the middle of you know, August, you're getting your refund, they want their money. But um, work with us, contact me, we can draft a letter. Sometimes, not always, sometimes that can be sufficient and they'll be willing to wait until you get that refund. Okay, great question. Yes, that's a very good point. Hi, um, in your experience, how do students do as far as like who, who finance most of their education with loans as far as being able to pay them back um, you know given the program and like given the job market and given everything just maybe anecdotes or anything you know about how successful students are with you know dealing with that mm -hmm. debt my experience of course I have no statistical data to back me up um, Students have been, uh, been able to, to remain in good standing with their loans, and that's because we drill into you, get in contact with your lender, get in contact with the Department of Ed, if you're taking a leave of absence, if you're graduating, if you're taking an internship, if you're not working, if you're not making enough money. So our students have been doing really well. If you look up like default rates um, for the university, and obviously we fit into that, it's very small. Um, but again, it's, it's you, you have to make that decision. And again, I cannot emphasize enough going to studentloans.gov um, and just really, really knowing what that will mean. And um, I think that's what makes our students successful in remaining in good standing and in repayment with their loans. And to that, um, we try to soak up as much financial literacy education as we can. Um, I mentioned a couple minutes earlier about beginning your repayment while you're in school, establishing that relationship with your servicer. Because after you graduate, you don't have to repay right away. You have six months and you might not be thinking about it. Okay, so you might be budgeting for whatever it is you're budgeting for based off the income you're making, but you're not thinking about that you have a loan payment to make as well and they want their money, right? So establishing that relationship early, so that's always included in your budgeting, that'll keep you you know, financially in a good ground when you get out of here. At least you're thinking about that. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to thank you, first of all. I've been emailing you guys a lot. <laughs> You've been really great with answering. Um, mm -hmm. But is there a cap for how much in scholarship students can receive? So in the event that funds are reevaluated, mm -hmm. is there a cap? There is not a cap per se, but remember how we said, and let's go with the MS full-time cost of attendance, which is $92,000, including living expenses and tuition, federal regulations state that whatever aid you are receiving, let that be in loans or in scholarships or work study, whatever the case may be, it cannot go above and beyond that number. If it goes above that, then the federal government says, whoa, you're out of compliance you have to do one or two things. Either you can, you're going to have to lower her loans, or um, what you can do is come in and say, well, you know what, you have budgeted um, 1100 for rent, but my rent is 1300 so I'm $200 short every month. You bring us proof. Everything that you want us to do, we're always gonna say, bring us documents, bring us documents. And that's because, again, federal regulations dictate that we have to have the specific documents. And we're gonna have uncomfortable conversations with you when you come in and you say, I wanna raise my loans and everything else. But again, it's because we're grounded in those regulations. So we will go one of those two routes. We will always lower the loans first um, before we touch any scholarship or anything like that. Thank you. Yeah. We're here to take more questions, but just to let you know, it's, it is. Yeah. 
tour time too, I believe, no? Yes, we're gonna have like, we're gonna be able to take maybe the two questions that are here, and then we're gonna have office hours from one to three, but. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Uh, could you just say a little bit more about uh, the estimated student contribution? Is that what we're supposed to have saved up, or what exactly is that? The expected, the stu expected student contribution, that's what the, um, the Department of Education stated that you should be able to pay out of your own pocket towards your education. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to pay the university that amount. It doesn't mean that's the only amount. But they're saying, based on the financial information you provided, you should be able to contribute X amount of dollars towards your education. But you are able to borrow, again, up to that cost of attendance. What you should be planning for is that shortfall, that email that we sent you, which I know wasn't very fun to send out, and people were like, oh my god, what are you doing? But um, that's what you should be planning on, on, on having. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So you have the uh, estimated tuition uh, and living expenses. Uh, for the estimated tuition and fees, how much does that tend to vary between year to year? Because you said that's not the final number, but... It's anywhere from 5% to about 8%, 7.5. Um, so it could be lesser, but I'm betting my salary that it's going to be probably a little bit more. I shouldn't bet my salary. It's not that much, but um, <laughs> they're like, you bet your salary. Um, but it's probably going to be a, a bit higher than what we've estimated. Okay, so with that, thank you again. I know this is not the most riveting of information, but it is critical information. We're here to help. And for those of you who are watching us on live stream, this is the end of the formal open house. Thank you, all of you, for joining us. And um, hopefully I'll see you here in the fall and in graduation. So um, welcome again.